the night where it all begins again. That was my audition to be WWE's spokesperson in the pay-per-view packages. Here we are, back by popular demand. And you, sir, have been very busy, so we had to put this off to the very last couple days of the month. But here we are. We are reviewing WrestleMania 20, where it all begins again. Oh, man. Here we are. It's a new era. It's a new era. Um, I know we've been talking about the Ruthless Aggression era for a while, but this is the first show where it really feels like a changing of the guard, um, especially as you get towards a the end of this pay-per-view. Days. A lot of things happened on this show, and as a kid, I was scared because that tagline of where it all begins again, I was convinced for a second that this was going to be the last WrestleMania ever, and Vince was just like, yep, let's end it at 20. This is where uh, it all ends. And here um, we are coming up on what, 39 is where we're going? Yeah, we're almost 20. We're almost to 40. We are almost 20 years from where it all began again, and Holy it feels crap. Like things are beginning <clears throat> all over again with WWE. This was a very, very, very important pay-per-view of my childhood for many reasons. We have a lot of iconic matches on this show. We have the launching pad for John Cena. We have the very last match from The Rock in seven years in between this, or eight years if you want to count, his last appearance in seven years in the WWE, at least in the ring. Yep. Uh, we have the infamous match between Goldberg and Brock Lesnar. We have an iconic WWE Championship match between Eddie Guerrero and Kurt Angle. A lackluster match between Undertaker and Kane, but this match was important in very so many other different ways. And of course, the main event. This could be regarded as one of the best main events in WrestleMania history. A controversial main event. We're talking about Chris Benoit, Triple yep. H, and Shawn Michaels for the World Heavyweight Championship. It's a main event that I can't really look at the same way after uh, the event of 2007, unfortunately. But I remember watching this, you know, live when I was okay. what seven years old when this was out. Um, four and, a, four and a half hours long, 12 goddamn matches to go through. Probably one of the biggest shows we've ever done on this podcast. Uh, one of the biggest we've ever tackled. Most definitely. Um, Not counting the two night WrestleManias that we've done. Um, this was, this was probably the start of WrestleMania just being larger than life. Uh, this would be the first of the last three shows that would be held in just arenas after that WWE would focus on football stadiums. Um, we have this year's mania in Madison square garden. We have next year's mania in the Staples center in LA. And of course, WrestleMania 22, which was in the all state arena in Chicago. You would mm -hmm. never hear those words ever again, a WrestleMania being held in a basketball arena, but in a hockey the arena, side, JR references yeah. the New York Rangers, uh, <laughs> which is um, just insane. But MSG is not a small arena by any regard. We talked about MSG before. This is like WWE's favorite arena in the world for many reasons. A lot of historic events have happened, including this one. And we have some good, we have some bad, and we have some some stuff that we want to talk about. Show. I feel very wishy-washy about this WrestleMania because there's some very, very, very good on this show, stuff on the show. But looking back on it, there was oh, a lot man. of filler. There was a lot of just we need to get everybody on this show. And they did try to get everyone on this show. And it came off in good ways and bad ways as we'll get on with the show. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's uh, certainly one of the most memorable WrestleManias for me. So I feel like I'd put it in the upper echelon personally. But um, there's some, uh, there's certainly some, uh, some bullshit that will hold it back from being the greatest of all time. JR claimed it was the greatest WrestleMania of all time when it was all said and done. And I was like, nah. That's subjective. I it's disagree. Definitely, but. yeah, definitely one of the greatest main events in WrestleMania history. Unfortunately, WWE can't really talk about this main event as much as the fans nope. do. It's like I said, it's a very controversial main event for a reason. But it's like not. I said, it's, I was ten it's not WWE's fault, though, is it? No, like it's just very <laughs> unfortunate. You yeah. go back at this mania, and there's a couple of black eyes on the show. When you when WWE goes back and they talk about past WrestleManias, the main events and such, like. They can't talk about the triple threat. They prefer not to talk about Goldberg and Brock Lesnar. So by, you know, by default, the main event of the show they regard is Eddie Guerrero versus Kurt Angle, which definitely could have been the main event, but mm -hmm. it was not the true main event. It was not the show that went, it was not the match that went on last. This is not like comparing Jericho and Triple H to Hogan and Rock at WrestleMania 18. This is not, 
you know, saying that CM Punk and The Undertaker had a better match when John Cena and The Rock, in other people's opinions, stunk up the stadium that year. But this is just one of those shows that has a huge asterisk next to it because they can't really talk about the main event. And it's not their fault, but... Well, we're going to change I, that. can't glorify the ending of this main event. Right, but we're... I mean, we're going to talk about it as best we can. Uh, we're going to go through each match one by one. The opener was something that you mentioned uh, towards the top. This would be the WrestleMania launching pad for one Jonathan Q. Cena. He comes out there, and he is wearing a Patrick Ewing New York, uh, the, the, bah, New York Knicks jersey, if I can speak. Um, he cuts, a, uh, of course, a babyface battle rap and says that his United States Championship match against the Big Show is actually against the hippo float from the Macy's Parade, which is very insulting. The Big Show is a gigantic man, and, uh, you know, <laughs> it's, uh, it's it's not a very nice you thing know, to say. But the crowd was way into it. compare this version of John Cena to Max Caster when it comes to raps, and I think the main difference here is is that Caster's all about the shock factor. His rap is really good. He's a very good rapper, and... The way he can just flow words together and just make everything relevant just to get it popped in the crowd is definitely a talent to be held. But John Cena's raps felt a little more original. They were focused more on insulting his opponent and, in this case, making it more relevant to where he was at the time. Mm -hmm. You know, you can compare those two styles of raps and say that Cena's was a lot more watered down compared to Max Caster's, but they're both good and both good in very good ways. I will say this is one of Cena's weaker raps, in my opinion. Uh, yeah, full blown baby face John Cena with a little sprinkle of tweener in there as we'll get in more into the show. But at this point, you could tell that Vince McMahon knew John Cena was the guy. Oh, and, yeah. You know, he, and as the story goes, we talked about this months ago, John Cena was on his way to getting fired from the company. It was him rapping on a bus with Rey Mysterio and his opponent, The Big Show, and Stephanie McMahon overheard him and asked mm -hmm. him if he wanted it to be on TV. The rest is history, as they say. And this was just really, you know, this was Cena's time. Oh, and you could tell that he was freaking fired up to be at WrestleMania. This was honestly, this was a dream come true for this guy at the time, which is just amazing to see. Was it just me or was this around the time when WWE was trying to get over the damn straight phrase for John Cena? I don't remember that at all. I, for some reason, like the crowd said damn straight in unison. And I was like, was that a catchphrase that Cena had? Because I know, completely forgot about it if it was. Not iconic to your shirt that you're wearing word life, but it's just Cena was still exper mm -hmm. experimenting with certain phrases like that. It wasn't, it you know, it was before Cena knew word life and you can't see me were getting over. Um, And as... You know, John Cena here is challenging the big show for the United States Championship. Of course. This match was a very good moment, but it was your basic standard match. But I have some issues with this match near the end. Um, it felt like Cena, an above average SmackDown match in a lot of ways. It yeah, was weird. Cena, Cena was doing his best and big show was showing off just what a monster he was at this time. This was unfortunately near towards big shows, quote unquote, bigger phase. As you yeah. go along in the timeline, he's getting bigger and bigger and not in a good way. Oh, like, my God. He was gigantic, wasn't he? He walked out yeah. there, and the U.S. title belt itself looked like a freaking toy. Like Yeah, like near 05 insane. and 06, that's when the commentators start pointing out that Big Show is well over 500 pounds at this point. He is He's pushing 540. Um, and I unfortunately, this is the time where that's starting to show for the Big Show. Um Big Show is just, this match is really just centered around how much of a monster show is. He is keeping Cena grounded for the most of this match. He's hitting big sidewalk slams. He's been hitting the big chops. He's keeping Cena grounded for the most part in this match. And it's oh, just yeah. really, this, for, the most of this match was a showcase for Big Show. I know this match is more about Cena. It's about his big moment, but it's not, you can't overlook the big show literally and figuratively figuratively he's large and in charge and he is dominating a good portion of this match yeah this match went nine minutes and 14 seconds and it felt like big show was in uh in control for about seven out of those nine minutes john cena made a very brief comeback there were loud let's go cena chants in there which oddly enough were not followed by cena sucks chants which was jarring looking back and watching it this crowd was yeah 100% behind John Cena, for sure. 
Um, there was also there's one thing. Yeah, I do appreciate about this match is that I think these guys did a very good job of keeping the flow consistent. Um, for a big man, little man match, this is nothing like the stuff you see today. Like the stuff I like, I always make the comparisons to Lashley and Finn Balor or Lashley and Eddie Edwards, where the flow is consistent in a spot where it's a cat and mouse. But it's just, I feel like Big Show's offense just was very consistent in this match. One thing I did notice is that a whole two years before Big Show would make this one of his signatures, he locks on a Cobra Clutch. He does. And I have to ask you right here, right now, which move do you like more? The Cobra Clutch Backbreaker or the Colossal Clutch? Oh, man, that's a tough one, man. Uh, oh, oh gosh. <laughs> Putting me on the spot here. I'm going to go ahead and yeah. say the Colossal Clutch. Mainly because it put over Big Show also as a submission specialist, which is odd in saying that because this guy's a giant and he can also choke you out. Um, yeah. They were experimenting a lot with the Big Show, and this was also a tribute to brand new WWE Hall of Famer Sergeant Slaughter. That was his finisher. Um, I appreciate the Cobra Clutch backbreaker because not only was Show using a submission, he would just fling guys <clears throat> across the ring like they were rag dolls, just showing how powerful and strong he was. Big Show was also busting out a lot of offense in this match you don't really see from him, like the aforementioned, uh, the, the showstopper of leg drop, one of Big Show's finishers that he rarely busted out. And for a big man of his size, he just pulled off that move effortlessly. Just yep. easily just swung his leg over Cena in one fell swoop and just crushed him into the mat. I, I was really appreciating Big Show's work in this match. It's not, it's not really put over enough. Um, but the big story, just like the Big Show's match against Brock Lesnar at Survivor Series 02 in this same building, might I add, um, was what would John Cena be able to lift up the Big Show for the FU, or now known as the Attitude Adjustment, of course. Cena hits the FU, but there's a near fall there, and Michael Cole puts it over as the first time someone has ever kicked out of the FU. And that's a humongous deal in 2004. People would kick out of the AA continuously through the years, but this is the first time it ever happened, and Big Show was really put over as a legitimate monster, but why, why do you have an issue with this finish? I thought it was pretty clever. Unfortunately, this is where my issues with this match start to peak out a little. Right after Cena hits the attitude adjustment, he motions over to his chain that is tucked away in the back corner. It, it sure is. wonder why the referee didn't get rid of that soon and sooner than this, but Cena signals to the to the chain he holds it up the referee takes uh you know wants to take the chain away from cena gives him the you can't see me and cena throws the chain to the side and goes for his brass nuts that he didn't mention in his rap he did he the, the, the custom nuts exactly yep. yeah he goes for the nuts he hits big show square in the head with it hits him with another attitude adjustment and pins big show to win the united states championship clean My issue with this is that clean with an asterisk right next to it. And here's my issue with the match. And I feel like commentators were kind of putting this over at the end. I feel like this ending kind of made Big Show look weak because in between the first attitude adjustment, the knuck shot in the second attitude adjustment, there was no offense from Big Show. He literally just laid there like a big rag doll waiting to take the finish. Well, he was selling like the FU. <laughs> he was selling the FU. It's a devastating Big finisher. Big Show would have kicked out of the FU I don't know. He didn't even get a chance to hit a choke slam. Maybe a little more offense, and then Cena would have went for the chain. I don't know. It's just like move, distraction from the referee, knock shot, move again, and Cena kind of just cleaned up Big Show like he was nothing. Like yeah. near the end of this match, Big Show really didn't seem like a threat anymore. And this is a huge moment for moment for Cena. Huge pop from the crowd. And Michael Cole says Cena has defeated the Big Show. Taz says yes. But he cheated. He did. He did. It's Cena kinda, did cheat. Cena is still in tweener phase right here. I don't know if I'm more upset with that, with that, or the fact that Taz was kind of trying to make it the focal point when that really isn't the case. Because you know, you could say, why are we celebrating a baby face winning by cheating? That if it was the other way around, you know, the heel would have been absolutely shamed to death for this. Well, then hold on. Um, hold on a second, then. If Eddie Guerrero is a babyface who wins by cheating all the time, then how come Cena can't do it, you know? Like, he has those weapons with him. <laughs> you know, it's a good point. I don't know. Maybe it's just that common sense of wrestling hypocrisy that's never going to go away, mind you. 
Yeah. I don't know. It was just, it didn't ruin the match for me, but I just noticed that maybe F you a little more offense from Big Show. Cena gets a little desperate. And, you know, desperation could have showed. He just mm. got his finisher kicked out of for the first time. So do you think the match should have gone longer then? Maybe just by like a minute, maybe a minute. You know, Big Show never even attempted to choke slam. There was no really threat to Cena near the end of this match. So again, that might be a little nitpicky on my end. This is still, um, not to jump the gun a bit, but it's pretty crazy that Cena's pop for winning this championship overshadows when he would win the WWE championship the next year in L.A. The crowd crazy, goes right? nuts for Cena winning this match. And he, Cena is happy, and he should be, because this is oh, his yeah. first singles championship. This is the launch pad for him. And, and it's also the opener, the- too. So the crowd is going to be super hot regardless. This is a perfect opener for Mania. I remember even as a kid, this match started, and I know Cena's going to win, and this is going to mm-hmm. be awesome. And it was. The moment I think, was awesome. I think wrestling-wise, it would... It, it's certainly not touching Bret Hart versus Owen Hart in this same building 10 years prior, obviously. It's not going to be a wrestling clinic. But in terms of the moment, making the crowd happy to really start this show on the right note is the perfect choice to have Cena go over oh, here. Yeah. Um, you're never going to forget Cena winning the United States Championship. You're not going to be thinking about the match. You're just going to be thinking about this is Cena's first title. And it was the opener of WrestleMania. This is also his in-ring debut at WrestleMania. Yeah. WWE doesn't really count his pre-show appearance. And you shouldn't, honestly. You shouldn't count the pre-show appearance last no. year because that was just a whole hot mess. We talked about it. Cena challenged Jay-Z to a rap battle. Jay-Z never got back to him. And WWE fully expected Jay-Z to get back. Or was it Jay-Z or was it Fabulous? No, no, no. He challenged Jay-Z. You sure it wasn't was Eminem? Fabulous. I don't know. He challenged a rapper to a rap battle. And WWE fully expected this rapper to like respond and do it, but they never did. And WWE nope. scrambled and just put Cena on the pre-show. So disregard that. This is Cena's true WrestleMania debut. That's wise. I'll give it two and a half stars. Yeah. Nothing amazing, but you know, it wasn't terrible. It was, it, it was a fine opener and it got the show. It got the crowd hype. I'll match it. I agree with you. I really love the moment, which is going to be a big theme for a good number of these matches. Um, yeah, definitely very significant for Cena's career being his first singles championship. And that's not the only time we're going to be talking about a singles championship win for Cena, for sure. Um, I do I do feel like the match was a bit lopsided, though. I do see your point. The Big Show was dominating a lot of the match. Um, I think if Cena got a tad bit more offense, maybe if it went a little bit longer, it would have improved a little bit. But um, yeah, you know, it, for what it was, it did its purpose. Um, and that we, would be an issue with Cena later on in his run. You could talk about his matches with Umaga, the great Kali, uh, when he returns to his feud with Big Show in 2009. Cena's matches could be very lopsided. And I feel like that's where a lot of the fans' anger came from. You know, Cena's going to take 90% of the offense, come back with the five moves of doom, and win like it was nothing. Even Hulk Hogan, his leg drop of doom, that was, you know... Uh, this guy, you know, quote unquote, buried everybody or went over on everybody. Even he was still dominant near his matches. Like, I think WWE really played too much into the Cena Superman. He's going to take all this punishment and he's going to come back and win. But mm-hmm. that's way down the line. We're going to be talking about that. Way um, down the line. Yeah. Um, Cena would be uh, fed a lot of giants throughout his career and he would wrestle Big Show so many times and i'm yeah i'm sure the crowd would get sick of that match a lot uh, the more vince mcmahon booked it but um, um that, before we, we get to this next match yeah, yeah yeah jonathan coachman i i, I wanted to talk about this and so jonathan coachman is strutting backstage and the first thing i'm noticing is that there's a lot of legends backstage and i'm just like cena just won the united states championship why aren't you guys watching why are you guys you know just shooting the shit backstage while wrestlemania is going on First yeah. thing I want to say is Coach looked like MVP. Didn't he? Oh, he man. Like <laughs> it's so like, weird. I know it's the other way around. MVP looked like Coach or anything, but I don't know. Maybe yeah, maybe MVP took some 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 inspiration from uh, <laughs> Johnny. Coach, Coach looked like he was about to join the Hurt Business or something like that. But <laughs> really anyhow, did. he... I uh, wonder why they never made Coach a heel manager. Because I feel like he could have gotten some longevity out of that. I oh, even better. Huge. Even better, yeah, Coach was a heel yeah, wrestler. He was yeah, a heel he, wrestler. <laughs> he was loved to hate, but he strolls into Eric Bischoff's office. I don't know why I'm noticing stuff like this. 
It's just that it's WrestleMania in Bischoff's office. That's no different. There's no special occasion. Bischoff's in there chatting it up with John Morrison, a.k.a. Johnny Nitro. John Hannigan. Yep. This was the first experimental phase with Morrison. As we all know, Morrison was on Tough Enough Season 1. And they were going to test Morrison out here as kind of Bischoff's assistant. You know, we won't be able to talk about this too much because Morrison gets injured and he kind of just shows up backstage randomly. Uh, Coach addresses Bischoff. He addresses Nitro. And Bischoff says, we heard a rumor that The Undertaker is in the building. Of course, Undertaker's in the building. He has, he a, has a match. <laughs> and of Bischoff, course. And Coach says the best thing I've ever heard. This is something I would say in 2022. But Eric, The Undertaker's on SmackDown. Yeah. He is. So, so why does Bischoff, why does he care? Why does he care about where The Undertaker is? You know, like Kane, that is Kane's business. I don't think Bischoff because wants to get into that family business. Bischoff, being the greedy son of a bitch he is, does not care about the personal family business. He wants to snatch up The Undertaker before SmackDown does. So he sends Coach to go find The Undertaker. Let me tell you, good sir, if I am at a beautiful gala or a party let's say for like a premiere of a Broadway musical or a movie or something as big as this. Me, the last thing I would want to do is for my boss to send me on a wild goose chase in the alleys behind the theater looking for somebody. <laughs> so that's basically what Bischoff does. And he tells Coach to look for The Undertaker. Coach says, I'm not comfortable looking for The Undertaker. And Bischoff says, well, you better get comfortable. Go look for The Undertaker. And this sets off on probably one of my favorite backstage segments in WrestleMania history. <laughs> More on that later. Yeah, we'll get to that. Um, speaking of backstage segments, we do have Randy Orton flanked by Ric Flair and Batista, who Ric Flair was super over in Madison Square Garden, by the way. And they go over pretty much the entire history that Randy Orton and Mick Foley had leading up to uh, this handicap match that we'll be talking about. Uh, they're standing in the same spot where the feud actually started last June when Orton kicked Mick Foley down a flight of stairs, which I thought was a great Three touch. Long-term storytelling. Yep. This started last June. So far in advance. And they, again, they go through the timeline of this feud. The the kick down the stairs in June. When something that kind of made me upset as a kid, Randy Orton challenging Foley for his Intercontinental, for Orton's Intercontinental Championship, Foley was a coward. Foley made his way down the ramp. He turned around and he went home. And yep. as a kid, I'm so ashamed of Foley for just turning away and, and, and basically running away from Randy Orton. What kind of baby face does that? <sighs> I, I, don't, I don't know, man. I still don't really get the coward angle. Maybe he was waiting for help, and that's why he called The Rock, and that's why he called Hollywood and all that, but uh, I, I don't know. I mean, the fully Orton feud is fascinating. This is certainly not the end of it. <laughs> Spoiler alert through WrestleMania, but... Um, we'll, we'll, we'll get to that when we get to that, yeah, but they flash back to, I think it's here. I don't know if it's here after mania, but it's one of the best Foley promos I've ever seen in my life. It's or in, uh, spitting in Foley's face. But I remember in this promo, Foley was so hyped and so passionate. He began punching himself in the face and he made himself bleed. I will <laughs> never forget that. It's one of it's probably the best Foley promo I've ever seen in my life. Might have been the and night after the Royal Rumble, um, if I remember yeah. right. Um, but I remember that clear as day and just thinking, "Holy shit, Foley's a man, man, not mad man." Or in quickly <laughs> Isn't retells he? that Foley called Hollywood. He called the Rock, and Evolution laid waste to the Rock and Foley. We will talk about Rock later, and I can't wait because. The Rock, uh, I don't want to give it away. Just it, it's it's awesome. It's the so Rock good, awesome. so good. Um, I get The Rock, my but, favorite of all time for multiple of reasons. But from okay, awesome to not so awesome. This is where real quick we find out this was a WrestleMania where they were trying to cram everyone on the show. It's one of two Fatal Four Way Sudden Death Fatal Four Way matches for this one, the World Tag Team Titles on Monday Night Raw. It's Garrison Cade and Mark Digjack. Remember when they were a tag team? Apparently, they were over enough to get a spot on WrestleMania. Uh, Garrison Cade obviously would go on to be Lance Cade with his better-known tag team with Trevor Murdoch. Mark Digjack was the WCW guy that survived the apocalypse. He survived mm -hmm. what they did to WCW, and he hung on to WWE long enough to get a couple of gimmicks here. Uh, the Dudley Boys, Bubba Ray and Devon, because obviously, why would you not have them a part of the tag team title picture? La Resistance, Renee Dupree, and Rob Conway making their WrestleMania debut. And they're, okay, 
three established tag teams taking on the randomest and most makeshift tag team, one of the most random and makeshift tag teams I've ever seen, RVD and Booker T, With- a.k.a. We have nothing for you. We're going to stop the tag team titles on you guys. And yeah, we have nothing for you after burying you in Triple H's reign of terror. So we're going to put the tag titles on you as a uh, as a safe keep. Um, and they come out with the worst tag team mashup theme song I think I've ever heard. It's Booker T's WWE Originals uh, track. And it's it's him rapping like usual. And then Splice in there is and like Van Damme. Van Dam is in this team too. <laughs> Two points I want to make about this. Number one, Can You Dig It is not a terrible song, but how dare you replace Booker's original theme song with that? How <sighs> fucking dare you? Also that, I remember when I was a kid and I loved these hybrid themes. Nowadays, I think I would puke if I ever saw one again. Um, this is just sheer, as a kid, you look at this and go, oh my God, RVD and Booker T, what an awesome team. As an adult, I look on this and I go, lazy, these guys could be doing better. They deserve better. I mean, we went from challenging for the World Heavyweight Championship to hear some tag team titles. Sometimes makeshift teams do work. The Bar, RK Bro, uh, you know, teams like how that. About, they can work. How about Hulk Hogan and Edge? Get the fuck out of here. Right <laughs> Gonna do that callback every time. Every time. In hell. It, I will tell you right now RBD and Booker T, they're up there. They're up there with Hogan and Edge, and they're up there with fucking Jason really? Gordon. Really? Wow. Okay. <laughs> okay. Oh, uh, um, yeah. But um, I hated this match. You know my first problem, though, right? They're if it's in and out. yeah, no disqualification, sudden death. Why are why are these idiots standing on the tag ropes? Like, why are they standing on the apron holding the tag ropes? Makes no um, sense. I hated this match. Let me tell you. I'll tell you why I hated this match. The only two legal teams in this entire match were Booker, RVD, and La Resistance. The Dudleys and Garrison, Garrison Cade and Mark Jindrak never get tagged into this match. They are sitting on the ropes, on they're sitting on the apron like geeks this entire time till near the end of the match when it becomes chaos. Oh. And chaos, and by chaos, I mean a little tiny tussle between all four teams. Little, you're really gonna sit the Dudley boys on the apron this entire match. Yeah, yeah, no, they're gonna do that, and they're gonna have Rob Van Dam hit a five star frog splash on a uh, Rob Conway to retain the titles. That's what they're gonna do. Um, One star. I hated this. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> Damn, you hated this with a passion. I hated this. Um, I don't remember anything from this match. I just remember as the match was going, I just go the Dudleys, nor Kate or Jindrak ever got tagged into this match i do Kane like the way Brown. that i do like the way Maybe the mini tussle like i do like the way the mini tussle started though i will admit when van dam goes for the first five star frog splash devon shoves him off the top rope and van dam crashes all the way to the floor and i thought he fucking broke his jaw in that barricade it was a gnarly landing it was a sick bump yeah. but look kate and Jindrak, i understand maybe vince liked him, them enough they he wanted to get them on the card they were very green there was nothing special about Cade and Jindrak. Jindrak would get a little better as the years went on, but that's because he was always surrounded by people that could protect his weaknesses. As the old story goes, Jindrak was actually supposed to be the original heavy of the of evolution before Batista. He was. But Triple H tells a story. They took Jindrak in to get a test run with him. They shot a bunch of photos with Jindrak in there. He said the entire time Jindrak was a giant man child. He was extremely immature. He did not take it seriously. So Triple H said, get the fuck out, Batista, get in here. Yeah. And just to think, in an alternate universe, Mark Jindrak would have been the heavy of evolution. And the rest is history indeed. Um, who knows what Batista would be doing if that was not the case. But, oh, we get to that segment. We get to the continuation of the coach thing. Yeah, so coach is investigating the backstage of MSG looking for the Undertaker. And he hears some ominous noises coming from behind the door. As a kid, I was hook, line, and sinker into this. As an adult, you can hear what's going on, and I'm just chuckling under my breath like a giddy schoolgirl because I know what's about to happen. Mm -hmm. He goes in there, and he finds Mean Gene Okerlund, future WWE Hall of Famer. And Gene Okerlund looks a little little roughed up. He has some 
some lipstick on his. Yeah, some hickeys on him. Yeah, coach is asking him, Mean Gene, what are you doing? And Okerlund says, I'm here for the Hall of Fame ceremony. And he goes, Yeah, but what are you? And before coach could finish, out pops Bobby the Brain Heenan, WWE yep. Hall of Famer who just got inducted. And he looks just as roughed up as Gene Okerlund. And coach is saying, What are you guys doing in there? I'm looking for the Undertaker. And Bobby Heenan says, We're playing cards. We're playing poker. We were playing poker. <laughs> Favorite gags, my favorite running jokes in WWE. Out comes Mae Young and the fabulous Moolah. They're getting on in whatever that little storage room is. And, you know, oh. I, I want to look at this as a more funny insight. Uh, May and Moolah pull Okerlin and Heenan back in. Heenan is literally, he's reaching for his life. He no, I don't want to go back in. I don't want to go back but in. He's going in back the door. He is trying to shut the door. And it's the most <laughs> awkward, most funny thing in the world. Two things. Number one, I loved how when WWE, when WWE, I guess, ran into a dead end or they were just looking for a sh- 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 some shock factor, they always brought out Mayo Moolah. And let me tell you right now, every single fucking time it worked. Oh, yeah. I never got tired of them. This was whenever funny. I heard that, yeah. Whenever I heard that piano music hit, I knew what was going to happen. I was in tears every single time it happened. And WWE, this was their go-to when oh. they were in a funny segment or uh, they were in something involving the women. They were just like, all of a sudden, boom, May and Moolah. Mean and Gene and the you. Brain were hilarious in this, and they're selling. Um, and may, them, may they both rest in peace. And all due respect all to Mean Gene, but could you, like, for some reason, the Brain was inducted into the Hall of Fame the night before. And he said in his speech that the only thing that would make this whole experience better is if Gorilla Monsoon was there to share it with him. And Gorilla Monsoon was his broadcast partner for God knows how many years. Could you imagine if Monsoon was still alive around this time? And it was oh, him. He would have been right there with him. Yeah, if it was him and Heenan and it was Gorilla Monsoon instead of Mean Gene, like, I don't know. Oh, yeah. You can only imagine the funniness. But that I mean. That's just me. That's just my gears turning. Mean Gene is still yeah. hilarious in here, and I love him, but I don't know. It was well, always him and, and Gorilla. Heenan next to JR and the King are the greatest broadcast pair. In Would you stop? History. Love it. Love it. Love it. The other thing I want to say is it's, it made me sad that all four yeah. of those people are no longer with us. Mm-hmm. Uh, thanks for the memories, and thank you for this funny segment. It's something I always remember. It's honestly one of the things I remember when I think of Mania 20. Beyond all those hilarious matches, I think of this backstage segment, and I remember enjoying it as a kid. There you go. There you go. Rest in peace, y'all. Um, okay. Speaking of memorable stuff, how about Chris Jericho versus Christian? Speaking of long-term storytelling, this started, when was it? Back in November or December when Jericho and Christian were still the best of friends. And backstage, they make a bet over one Canadian dollar. Chris Jericho tells Christian that he can nail Trish Stratus before Christian can nail Lita. And along the way, Jericho, tail as all this time, was getting actual feelings towards Trish Stratus. And Trish was returning those feelings. Um, you look at this video package, and it's the cheesiest. It's full of romance. It's so it's good. Of, so, yeah, it's so, so cheesy, good, but in a good way. It's the epitome of what professional wrestling is all about. Chris Jericho is falling over Trish Stratus. They're both talking about each other. They have a crush on each other, but Christian doesn't like that Trish Stratus is quote unquote stealing his best friend. And Bischoff does not like that one of his main cronies in Jericho is basically turning into a little softy. Yeah. To to put it in nice words. And Bischoff in retaliation, six Christian on Trish Stratus and puts him in a one-on-one match with Trish Stratus. And Christian is swearing up and down. This isn't going to be a match. I'm going to lay down. I'm going to let you pin you. I don't want to do this. But Christian's true color show in this match when he kicks out and he just puts a wailing on Trish Stratus, puts her in the walls of Jericho and will not let up. That leads to this WrestleMania match between two former best friends who have been teaming for two years at this point. And this is a blow off. You couldn't ask for a better blow off between the yeah. tag team than this, honestly. This was a very, very good match. Um, this whole angle effectively turned Chris Jericho into a white meat baby face, which is awesome. And Christian getting a big spotlight here at WrestleMania as a singles guy is just amazing to see after being left off of last year's mania card. 
in the in this retrospective, of course. Uh, Tim White is the official, by the way. Um, after coming out of retirement from uh, separating his shoulder in a Hell in a Cell match, also involving Chris Jericho, um, this was oh, this was so good. I mean, it felt like a fight, but you also had like those sprinkles of great Canadian wrestling in here. Um, yeah, you put Christian and Jericho in here, and it, you're you're going to expect a good wrestling match. Um, they gelled really well together here. There's some really good grappling spots here. Uh, there's a really nice sequence of Jericho and Christian throwing each other into the ropes. Some good slams, some good suplexes. Jericho hits a hits a bulldog. He goes for the lion salt, which Jr. calls the springboard lion salt. Sounds a little repetitive to me. I think Christian it's redundant. Up here. Yeah, it, it, it's a good sequence here. And Jericho and Christian, despite this being a personal feud, you said it best. There, there was some good wrestling in here. Christian locks on a Texas clover leaf on Chris Jericho as a tribute to Dean Malenko, which is awesome. Um, he doesn't. Uh, Christian gets to the ropes right away after Jericho locks in the walls, but it's shortly after this where Trish Stratus runs down to the ring to a huge fucking pop, by the way. Um, and basically, Christian and Jericho. Uh, so Trish gets on the apron when Christian's in control. And Christian grabs Trish by the hair, pulls her into the ring, and JR's like, come on, leave her alone, you son of a bitch. Um, and Jericho has seen enough. He goes after Christian, and it's a fantastic finish. So Trish is almost in the fetal position in the corner. Jericho goes to comfort her, and Trish doesn't know that it's Jericho. So she instinctively throws up an elbow, smacks Jericho right in the face. Christian with the schoolboy pin, and he beats Chris Jericho clean in the middle. Um, which is awesome. Putting Christian over, beating the first undisputed champion at WrestleMania. Um, three, uh, actually, three and three quarters. I really liked this match. It was really good wrestling. Yeah. I'm going to give it a three and a half. It's definitely a diamond in the rough in this huge WrestleMania card. It's a match that doesn't get talked about a lot. And it's, I feel like this match doesn't get talked about a lot because what happens after the match is oh boy. You know, considered what happens even better. One of the biggest swords I remember as a kid I was so mad. I was so mad when I was a kid. <laughs> and reveals that this has just been an entire coup, you know, throughout this robbery. She aligns herself with Christian, and there we go. Babyface Jericho wailing in pain as a newly turned heel Trish Stratus hooks up with Christian. Uh, they make out on the ramp, which I was very surprised at. Yep. And that shot would actually become a part of the Raw intro. And I freaking love that. It just showed it sure would. what a nasty pair these two would be. Um, oh. We'll get into this later as this retrospective goes on. But this feud yes. goes from being really good to kind of just falling flat. I feel like a it little, went on a little too long. Yeah. Yeah. It kind of was drawn out a little too long, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, and let's just say a big problem is going to get introduced into this feud. I see what you did there. I see what you did We're there. And I'm not looking, looking forward to talking about this. Nope. Nope, not at all. Um, but as a swerve, Trish uh, is pulling Jericho back from starting another fight, slaps Jericho a couple times, and Christian hits Jericho with the kill switch, and then him and his new girlfriend walk away. To be continued. To be continued. Um, Rarely do you see feuds get started at WrestleMania. Yeah. And this know, is a feud that have been going on since November at the time. Yeah, you know, a new layer to the feud. And you could talk about, like, the last time this happened and the only time I remember for a while is when AJ Styles and Shinsuke Nakamura did at WrestleMania 34. But WrestleMania is more for a feud's ending or just that one and done. Like, nothing mm -hmm. else is going to happen after this. Yes. So, Lillian Garcia, we cut to Mick Foley backstage, and Lillian Garcia is getting ready for an interview before this next matchup. And then my favorite wrestler of all time, The Rock, shows up, and he cuts such a fun promo where the he. Rock, and this is what I wanted to bring up earlier. The Rock looks damn good. This is Doesn't one he? of my favorite looks of The Rock, and it's a damn shame we only got this for one night. He is growing out his hair a little. He's got the fresh haircut. He's got the fresh mustache. He's got the little goatee. He's got his brand new tribal tattoo that he got in between mm -hmm. his runs. He was a lean and mean, and The Rock looked fucking good. Remember, he's basically the last time, he's got the uh, he's got the be cool look, the get shorty sequel uh, without the afro um, and without the singing. So that's a forgettable film in all intents and purposes. But um, side note, I remember I was on a kick of I'm gonna watch every single movie The Rock was in when I was a kid. That was impossible to do nowadays. 
but we rented Be Cool, and when it was done, we sat there for a second, and my dad goes, that movie sucked. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, The Rock wasn't really putting out bangers like he is right now with Black Adam and everything like that. Um, yeah, but it's just a shame because The Rock looked so damn good. Remember, the last time we saw The Rock was at um, Backlash 03 when he put over Goldberg, and we hadn't seen him for almost a year, so... And, you know, spoiler alert, this is the last time we're going to see The Rock in a ring for eight, for seven years. Yeah. Eight years until his next match. So, look Which at gutted it. me as a kid. I was always watching Raw, like, looking for The Rock because he was my favorite. But um, yeah. I knew he was a big he, movie star. So. I think the game, let him be. the very first SmackDown versus Raw, this was the book they went for with The Rock. And let me tell you, The Rock, I played as him every single time because he had this iconic look. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's so great. But he cuts this promo about how, oh, everybody in this building believes in you. He uh, is walking backstage in Madison Square Garden. He shows Superfly Snuka and Don Morocco conversating backstage. And that's the match that inspired Mick Foley to become a wrestler, hitchhiking to Madison Square Garden, seeing Superfly jump off the cage. So great callback. Uh, he also sees Hurricane and Rosie, the Hamburglar and Grimace with a hamburger backstage. The S H I T, the S H the S H I T holding a double cheeseburger, which is awesome. Uh, I love that The Rock never let go of the Hamburglar thing with the Hurricane, even as a baby face. Oh yeah, <laughs> it's so funny. And uh, he drops some innuendos on Lillian Garcia, of course, flirting with her. And he shows the whole crowd through that LED uh, entryway in the uh, center of Madison Square Garden against the hard cam. It's uh, when it comes to promos. When people ask me who the best talker of all time was, you think of Paul Heyman. Some people think of CM Punk. Nobody could touch The Rock. Not at all. Not at all. The Rock was the best. On the mic, and one nobody could touch best it. Segues, yeah, the one of the best segues into this match was this promo, and bam, hit the music. They already got the 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 hype package out of the way. It's this is a special attraction three on two handicap match. It's Batista, Ric Flair, and Intercontinental Champion Randy Orton representing Evolution. No Intercontinental title on the line. Taking on one of the most underrated teams in <sighs> WWE in history, the Rock and Sock Connection, Mick Foley and the Rock. If you don't know about the Rock and Sock Connection, she's too young for you, bro. Back in the Attitude Era, I love this the team. had this special relationship. And it's a relationship that I can relate to personally. It's the dweeb, the nerd, the dork. And the jock. Raggedy old, you know, fully not the prettiest man in the world. Being best friends with the popular guy, the jock, the muscled, you know, I, again, this is personal. This is this, I, this is relatable to me. I've been through that in my life. And it's even and, more rewarding. It's even more rewarding if you look back at 1999 and see how they became a tag team after they spent all winter beating the shit out of each other. The exactly. Rock and hitting Mick like, Foley with ten protect unprotected chair shots at the head of the Royal Rumble, and then their tag team champions not even seven months later. It's crazy yeah, it's, how that works out. It's, it's one of my favorite tropes, and it's a team that you know it wasn't. It didn't go on for too long, but Rock and Sock, that shit was awesome. Oh. Um, like I said, fully recruited The Rock to take on uh, Evolution in this match. And you know what? I don't remember this match hitting as hard as it did. It was amazing. I freaking love this handicap match. Honestly, I like... I have one issue with this match, and it's not even until the end. Yeah. Yeah. I, I see what you're saying there. Everybody was getting their spots in. But you know what the highlight of the match was? Was The Rock's interactions with the Nature Boy Ric Flair. And I told Tomas this, and he didn't believe me. But The Rock and Ric Flair actually had wrestled one-on-one -on -one before this. And it was eight days after The Rock became the Undisputed Champion at Vengeance 02. They wrestled, I believe, in Ric Flair's hometown on Raw. Because The Rock had always wanted to wrestle Ric Flair. And he wanted to get that out of the way before he became a full-time movie star and everything like that. It's a damn shame we never got a proper Rock and Flair feud. It was you so know, amazing. Rock and Flair in 98. Imagine if Flair never went to WCW. He stayed in WWE and he wrestled The Rock in like 1998. <laughs> Rick had a video program. Ric Flair was so flabbergasted at how much The Rock was mocking him with the strut. He was so offended. <laughs> and it was the best thing. <laughs> was it was so, so offended. Um, early on in this match, you know, the commentators mentioned that this is Foley's first match in four years, his first proper match in four years. And Foley takes 
one of the nastiest bumps. He is known for two nasty bumps, and I hate them so much. Randy Orton sends Foley knees first into the steel steps, oh. and Foley, you know Foley's game. He is unprotected. He takes all of these nasty bumps. His knees slam into these steel steps, and he flips over them. And JR said best, how do you not break your kneecaps? It and was sick, Foley, wasn't it? How was Foley's knees not made out of jello at this point? Because he took that spot way too many times than he cares to admit. The other spot I'm talking about is when he would get knocked off the apron and he would splat onto the concrete on the back. No give whatsoever. No good at all. Um, and this is also the only time you would ever see the rock mix it up with the likes of Randy Orton and Batista in the ring. Um, Batista was still pretty green around this time too. Um, but he was, he was improving. He was getting a lot better. I loved, loved, loved how the rock took the Batista bomb in these various segments. Um, during the Mick Foley, this is your life segment on the go home Rob, which is a very underrated segment. Not a lot of people talk about that one. The rock returning the favor. Um, Batista hits the rock with a Batista bomb. Very, very clean. Um, yeah, uh, the trilogy, you know how, you know, you're a movie buff. You know how the trilogy goes. First one's the best. The second one's not that great, but it's pretty good. And then you have that third movie that just sucks all the balls in the world. And what I'm, what am I, what am I talking about? When Foley came back in 2012 and tried to do This Is Your Life with John Cena, it was so bad that The Rock came out the next week and Rock bottomed him just to say, don't ever do that again. <laughs> Rock bottoms Mick Foley. Um, but yeah, this is... I mean, it's great. Two hot tags, two hot tag sequences, one for Foley and then one later for The Rock. Um, Flair, <laughs> my favorite part of the match was Ric Flair going for the people's elbow. And the fact that he was taking so much sweet ass time, like running the ropes and making fun of this people's elbow was just the best thing ever. And The Rock kips up, hits a people's elbow on Flair with a Ric Flair strut. And it was... Uh, so entertaining. I loved when The Rock modified the people's elbow uh, to cater to his you know, opponents. I noticed this match was really good because near the end of this match we we're talking about, there was just this clean-ass sequence of Batista, Orton, Rock, and Foley just getting all of their shit in. Just Orton, clean offense. Even Batista. I'm going to give Batista his props. He was still pretty green at this point, but he was protected and he was hitting some nice-ass spine busters on The Rock. Like you said, he hit a Batista bomb, and The Rock only kicked out because I think there was just a little bit too much time in between there. And considering yeah. how they were trying to push Batista, the Batista bomb was pretty protected. It and was. You know, The Rock. If anyone's going to kick out of it, it's going to be The Rock. Yeah, The Rock The Rock took a clean-ass Batista bomb, too. And like I said, and it's uh, great, great selling. The Rock is not really uh, appreciated enough in how good his selling is. Uh, the Rock did hit Randy Orton with a rock bottom for a nice false finish. And another thing that made this match so great was the crowd. Their energy, they were so into this thing. Hook, line, and sinker. You know, um, again, because you look at the match, Foley, The Rock, Batista, Randy Orton, Ric Flair. You're never going to see the combination of any of these guys ever again. It's an all-star cast. Foley and Orton. It is an all-star cast. Um, a lot of people think the match went too long in 17 minutes. I disagree. I think this was so entertaining. Um, honestly, if it were me, I would have shortened a match that's later on and added more yeah, time to this, this thing. Is, this is the third best match of the night. Yeah. Four stars. Four stars. It's this so entertaining. My only issue with this match, I think the wrong people went over. Yeah. Yeah. So basically, Randy Orton hits an RKO out of nowhere on Mick Foley and pins him clean in the middle. Uh, and Foley kind of no-sells it. Yeah, Foley should have beat him. He, he immediately sits up and he's arguing with the ref like it was a schoolboy finish with the tights being pulled. And I'm just sitting here thinking, not only do I think Rock and Sock should have went over, you know, Foley didn't even sell the RKO. And here's my reasoning. If anyone disagrees, why Rock and Sock should have went over? This is the last time you're going to see the Rock in the ring in eight years. Mm -hmm. um, this is an ongoing feud. And this is kind of your attraction match. One of your attraction matches. Next month, Randy Orton's going to have the match of his life against Mick Foley, and he's going to beat Mick Foley. Yeah. I feel like you should have thrown Foley a bone. I know Foley is known as the lovable loser. I know mm -hmm. this was tailor-made and designed for Randy Orton to be the biggest star. You know, they were pushing the stars, and Orton was, you know, on track to being a big star. And I know Evolution is supposed to be this untouchable heel faction. But I just think 
But with this Around build, Flair, Mr. Socko to Randy Orton just to keep him down. Just to yeah. give the Rock a nice send off. You I don't even need to. Appreciate. You don't even need to pin Randy Orton here. Yeah, exactly. Just have fully lock in the mandible claw. Rock hits a rock bottom on both Batista and Flair, and boom, he's off to film Be Cool or whatever his next movie was. The game plan. I don't know, but yeah, give him I a nice send off. I don't think there's any shame in getting pinned by the Rock. No. <laughs> if you think getting pinned by the Rock is a burial, then I'm sorry, son. Pack up your bags and get out of this business, because yeah. CM yeah. Punk. So. Yeah, it's a four-star match. Um, yeah, I love this thing, regardless. Nitpick, that's my only nitpick. And even as a kid, I was mad. And every single time I watched this Mania, I, I just I, I wanted Rock and Sock to go over. Yeah. So, The Rock uh, the Rock is clearly frustrated that uh, Foley lost, but um, he forgives him eventually. The crowd gives him a standing O, which is well-deserved. Um, after yeah, this... Know, we've said this in this retrospective so many times. But with this and another person, we meet at this time. This is the last time you're going to see The Rock until 2011. Mm -hmm. The last time, with an exception of a video package he did for the 10-year anniversary of SmackDown in 2009. You can't even count that because it was a via satellite pre-taped video he package. Would do some, he would have some sporadic appearances in 2004 here and there. One to help Eugene against Jonathan Coachman, which is a super underrated segment on Monday Night Raw. Um, he would also do a brief little video package providing his prediction for the Battle of the Billionaires at WrestleMania 23, which a lot of people don't remember, but I do. I do. I remember all the rock stuff. So I'm like, yeah. So match wise and big promo, big, you know, uh, the, the angle wise, this is be the last time we're going to see the rock. Mm hmm. Which is very, very sad. And I, I love that which man again, to death. With this man and another guy we're going to be talking about later, I know we've said this like, Four or five times. This is the last time you're going to see him. This is like, you know, we mean it this time. Yes. We mean it. <laughs> we mean it this time. And it's going to be even more of a we mean it when we get to another certain match. Thank you, Rock. Uh, I can't wait to see you wrestle Roman Reigns at WrestleMania. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. Um, after this, you get the longest uh, recap of the Hall of Fame, I think, in WrestleMania history. Um, the Hall of Fame because 2004 class. Yeah, because me and Gene went through this all their the accomplishments. Time? Isn't this when they brought it back? Yeah, the first time since 1996 they brought it back. Yeah, because Hall of Fame went on hiatus. I don't know why. Why would you ever do that? But yeah, so I think they wanted to make it a big deal that it was back. Big John Stud, Junkyard Dog, uh, inducted posthumously, both of them. You also have Don Morocco, Greg the Hammer Valentine, Harley Race, Jesse the Body Ventura, Sergeant Slaughter, Superstar Billy Graham, Tito Santana, Bobby the Brain Heenan, and Pete Rose, who got a huge negative reaction from this New York crowd. Um, but well, First of all, he's in New York. Second of all, Pete Rose is an asshole, so he deserved it. Yeah, good. Good. So, um, in any case, um, how do you follow a match filled with legends? Uh... Tori Wilson and Sable versus Stacy Keebler and Jackie Gaeta. This is always the match I fast forwarded because this is something I just didn't need on this card. I'll be honest. For those of you who care, this is an interpromotional inter match. Again, for those of you who care, this match came about because Tori Wilson and Sable were on the cover of Playboy. Miss Jackie and Stacy Keebler feel like it should have been them. So let's sexualize them and put them in a match. Okay. That's that it. Aside, that aside, two things I noticed about this match. Number one, they tried, and it showed. <laughs> Number two, they looked like they were having fun. Yeah. Oh, no. I mean, I'm not denying they're having fun, but was the... I mean, I'm sure some people in the crowd were having fun watching this match, for sure. Uh, referee Jack Doan, I'm sure, was having a great time. Uh, Michael Cole and Taz, Taz I'm sure, were having Michael a blast. Cole, I'm going to take a water... I mean, I'm going to take a hose with ice cold water and take it to Michael Cole and Taz because they needed to calm down mm -hmm. this entire segment. Chill out. Take well, they were, shower. they were rooting for, uh, for their SmackDown women. So, I mean, a little bit biased, but, um, and there was, what I say about, they were trying, I mean, Tori Wilson's not a bad wrestler and her and Miss Jackie, they were trying some sequences in here. Her and Stacy were role. doing a whole roll through sequence. It was what? Yeah, and it didn't look bad. Like, you know, I know this isn't what this match is about. And like Michael Cole says, 
it's the classic line for those of you keeping keeping score at home like this i feel like i didn't totally hate this as a wrestling match it was there it was what it was you know what does the e stand for in wwe entertainment, entertainment. i actually thought this was entertaining yeah things considered. i mean i'm gonna go ahead and give this an na uh tory tory and sable win what what else do you really want me to say about it i mean no, again for, it existed. for those who care you for know, those who care my thing after watching this match is when is stacy cuba going to go in the hall of fame this is way overdue. After hearing Tori Wilson's inspirational speech, I want to see Stacey Keebler come in and do the same thing because regardless of what her role was in WWE, she actually has longevity in professional mm -hmm. wrestling. She dates back to WCW as Miss Hancock. So I she think sure does. she has her rightful place in history. You know, because I shout all in. over Tori Wilson, WWE Hall of Fame, and shame on me for doing that. But after hearing her speech and knowing that she really grew to love the business... You know, she's one of my favorite people in the world. Yeah. If Tori can go in, Stacey Keebler certainly can. Um, also, to that asshole that bullied her when she was a kid and called her ugly, I bet you feel really fucking stupid now. How dare you? How dare you yeah. call Tori Wilson ugly? Come on. That's not yeah. cool. Um, <laughs> so, there's a very important backstage segment that I would like to cover before you uh, go into this next match, my friend. Eddie Guerrero, WWE champion, is uh, backstage shaking hands with various talent like Spike Dudley, Paul London, Billy Gunn, the one Billy Gunn they happen to be lurking in the hallway. He goes into Chris Benoit's locker room, who's pacing around like a rabid Wolverine. And uh, they basically get into this conversation about, oh man, who really... <laughs> Eddie Guerrero was so awesome in this because he was like, you're facing... Triple H and Shawn Michaels. Nobody really thinks you're. Nobody really believes that you're going to win, Holmes. That's that's my best impression of him. I'm sorry, but um, <laughs> he's he's trying to rile Chris Benoit up, and it works because Benoit it was works. pissed. Yeah. He was so pissed, and then Eddie was and like, he was saying, I don't care if you don't believe in me. I believe in me. This is my night. I'm gonna win the title. And let me tell you, this is one of the most genuine promos I've ever seen in my life, and. Watching this, especially after watching Dark Side of the Ring, it's eerie. It's yeah. very, very eerie. Yeah, Benoit was not really known oh, for his uh, abilities on the microphone, but um, he he backs it up in the ring. And he if undoubtedly... Anyone, yeah, if anyone was going to bring this passion in a promo out of him, it was going to be Eddie Guerrero. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. His best friend, of course. The WWE champion who looked so natural with that undisputed championship on his shoulder and around his waist. I mean, I don't really think it fit anybody better. All due respect to Brock yeah. Lesnar and to Kurt Angle, but that championship fit Eddie Guerrero like a glove. So It did. That's it's a damn shame it didn't go longer. Yeah. Yeah. We'll get to that, won't we? But um, yeah. speaking of Guerreros and championships, Tomas, um, another case of let's cram everyone on the show. And then it was by this point that I realized SmackDown really got the short end of the stick with this WrestleMania. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. Surprisingly, you know, and what should have been a one on one match turned into a cruiserweight open gauntlet match for the cruiserweight championship. So, how this match worked, it wasn't like your traditional gauntlet match where two wrestlers would wrestle and then after you defeat one, the other person would enter. All of the cruiserweights surrounded the ring and they already knew what order they were going to enter. I think this was WWE's way of just getting everyone's entrance out there just so they have to, you know, continuously do it, keep the flow of the match. And I think it worked in its favor, but it's Chavo Guerrero defending the championship against Akio, Billy Kidman, Funaki, Jamie Noble, Nunzio, Rey Mysterio, Tajiri, Shannon Moore, and the debuting Ultimo Dragon, which... Have we talked about Ultimo Dragon on this? I don't no, think we have. And the reason why is because WWE took a huge fucking shit on this guy. One of the most decorated and known wrestlers in Mexico and Japan. And WWE no, didn't know what the fuck to do to him. This is so infamous for all the wrong reasons. Ultimo Dragon makes his entrance and he slips. Fucking trips on his cape, doesn't he? And oh. WWE was so ashamed of this. They edited it out of the Peacock version. And they just took a wide shot of the arena. And if you squint your eyes and look really closely, you can still see it, but... Oh, I saw it. I saw it. They couldn't mask it. They couldn't mask it. No pun intended. For some reason, they will laugh their ass off at Tyus O'Neal slipping under the ring. 
they will keep in the slips from WrestleMania a couple years ago because of the rain. But for some reason, they are so ashamed of Ultimo Dragon's botch that they mm -hmm. want everyone to forget about it. But you know what, WWE? You're not going to forget about it. <laughs> nope. Uh, Ultimo Dragon pins Shannon Moore really quickly after an Asai DDT. In comes Jamie Noble, who Tomas really wants to put over in this. So uh, he basically... He was the MVP of this match. He goes in and uh, chokes out Ultimo Dragon with a guillotine. See you later, bye. That's your only WrestleMania appearance, my friend, and it's a damn shame. Yeah, I think that's his only pay-per-view appearance. I think so. <laughs> I think so. In his whole it's WWE sad. tenure. Ah, uh, sad. With the yeah. Ultimo Dragon. In WWE. Why? Uh, why put Ultimo Dragon on your roster when you can have I don't know Kenzo Suzuki or Mordecai or. <laughs> <laughs> who, who the fuck else is on SmackDown? Tell me I'm wrong. But if WWE ever brought in Juice and Thunder Liger, they would have done the same thing to him. Yeah. 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 Juice and Thunder Liger was smart to wait until 2015 to wrestle Tyler Breeze. Um, Jamie Noble is wrestling Funaki, and Funaki hits a cross body. Jamie Noble rolls through, pins him in eight seconds. As funny as that is, that was a clean ass sequence. It was a clean ass sequence, but. I don't remember that ever happening. And the announcers are trying to put it over like, it's the quickest WrestleMania victory in history. <laughs> and I'm like... And huge quotation marks because it's a gauntlet match. It That's is a gauntlet great. match. Another, it's not King Kong wait, Bundy beating whoever it was. You know? Said, but let's wait another four years when Kane pins Chavo Guerrero in seven seconds for the ECW championship. Oh, God. And that is the shortest WrestleMania victory in history. Don't even remind me. Don't even remind me. The Rock, the Rock pinning Eric Redbeard does not count. That's a segment, you know. <laughs> That's a segment. It's not a match. If I'm um, Eric Redbeard, I'm writing that until my fucking grave. Mm -hmm. I'm telling everyone I wrestled the Rock at WrestleMania. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus Christ. Uh, oh. Nunzio goes in the ring and is wrestling his kayfabe cousin Jamie Noble. Uh, the crowd he is, is chanting. Over. The crowd is chanting, over. there's a portion, there's a whole section in Madison Square Garden chanting, let's go Guido. I'm sure those were ECW marks that were, uh, that were solidly behind him. Uh, Nunzio is counted out. In comes Kidman. Real quick, before uh, that happened, when Nunzio gets counted out, the crowd boos. They're mad. They were so upset that Nunzio was out of that. Um, Billy Kidman. Uh, I was go. convinced that during this whole sequence, Noble was trying to eliminate Kidman as fast as possible before he fucking killed somebody. Mm -hmm. Because in the beginning portion of this, um, Nunzio, does he grab Kidman? Yeah, he grabs Kidman and pulls him out of the ring. There's a little brawl on the outside. And I know it's going to happen, and I'm already cringing. Kidman goes for the shooting star press. And if you guys do not know, Billy Kidman shooting star press is the ugliest, most unsafe shooting star press I've ever seen in my life. And let me kind of, kind of try and go into the physics about this. You look at shooting star presses nowadays, and the wrestler uses their momentum when they're in the air to do a full flip before they come crashing down. Kidman flips and comes down at the same time, and it looks horrible. So Kidman balances himself on the top rope, in the middle of the top rope, and he goes for a shooting star press. Thank God Noble catches him because if he didn't, Kidman would have landed on his fucking head on the cement. Oh yeah, Kidman would have been dead. At the at the best, paralyzed if Noble did not yeah. catch him. Um, so that's why, in Tomas's words, Jamie Noble is the MVP of this match. He did last the longest, and he also saved the most lives of this match. <laughs> like he really you know, did. The consummate professional Jamie Noble is. He never gets enough respect. But Billy and Kidman pins him. Is it, how ironic is it that Noble saves Kidman like this, but then later on becomes the producer of The Undertaker and Shawn Michaels in a match where Undertaker almost killed himself because Sim Snuka was not in place to catch him. Mm-hmm. Oh, the irony, huh? <laughs> oh, the irony. Yeah. Um, Noble is pinned by a BK bomb, and in comes Billy Kidman's former tag partner, Rey Mysterio, who is cosplaying as The Flash this year, um, after, uh, cosplaying as Daredevil at the previous WrestleMania Cruiserweight title match against Matt Hardy version one. Uh, yeah, nowhere to be- When it comes to WrestleMania attire, no one's ever going to touch Rey Mysterio. 
No. No. I love the fact that he cosplays as various uh, comic book characters every single year. It's love a it. great we'll touch. Talk about it more. Mm-hmm. Uh, Kidman and Mysterio have a nice little sequence. Uh, you know, basically Mysterio hits... There's a really great elimination here. Mysterio literally hits a code red on Billy Kidman off the second rope, which looked gnarly. But it was so clean. Somehow Kidman no. had the cleanest landing. And Mysterio pinned him. Get the fuck him. out of here, Billy Kidman, you fucking Ray Romano-looking motherfucker. <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> he, I, I don't think Tomas is a Billy Kidman fan, uh, from we what I've gathered. Done with Kidman. I know we have a full like year that we're going to be talking about him, but um, mm-hmm. yeah, more on that later. Tajiri is next to face off Mysterio, and they have more of their uh, typical fast-paced action. Uh, Tajiri goes for the green mist. Akio, later known as Jimmy Wang Yang, is standing on the apron. Tajiri sprays the green mist, and Akio is eliminated like that because he can't um, continue because of the blinding. Akio never needed to be in this match. Yeah, probably not. But he I was mean, there to take the mist, and then Cole was saying, "I don't think Akio can compete," and I'm just like, "Then why'd you put him in the match?" Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, um. What, does Vince hate in odd numbers? <laughs> I mean, I thought I thought this match did have odd numbers. Uh, with Akio out of there, there were nine dudes in this thing. Um, yeah. So, Tajiri is pinned by a 6-1-9. In comes Chavo Guerrero. And honestly, this whole gauntlet went 10 minutes. Um, so, Mysterio and Chavo only wrestled really for like one or two minutes. Like, total. You know, this is my other sort of nitpick about this match when at the beginning they said Chavo Guerrero was always designated the last person to come in then it kind of takes out the tension of a gauntlet match it kind of should have just been a gauntlet match and the winner faces Chavo Guerrero for the Cruiserweight Championship you know what I mean it should have just been a battle royal you know if he really wanted to make Chavo Guerrero run the gauntlet you know no pun intended then he would have started at number one mm-hmm Mm-hmm, but uh, so, again, that's a tiny nitpick. It doesn't bother me that much. It just made me scratch my head a little. You got to remember, uh, Theodore Long was not the babyface SmackDown general manager at this time. It was Paul Heyman. So he gave Chavo that luxury of entering the match last. Um, so Chavo uses Chavo Sr. to cheat, and he beats Rey Mysterio, retains the Cruiserweight title. Nine pinfalls in 10 minutes does not equal a good match, my friends. I hate to break it to you. Um, star and a half. They tried. I mean, it was a fun sequence, and it really showed how talented all these gar- guys are, you know, botches aside. But, you know, again, you're trying to cram so much in here. Guys like Funaki got made to look like a joke. Akio never got into the match. Nunzio was super over with the crowd, and he gets counted out. Uh, Noble's the MVP in this match. Again, this was all about Mysterio and Chavo, but they right. wanted to get everybody in on this show. And Ultimo Dragon looked like a fucking chump. He sure did, man. He sure did. I can get. I think I can give it a two because I appreciated the work in the ring. But when you try to cram again this much in there, you have unsafe moments, like oh. Kidman doing a shooting star press off the middle rope, bit, which he never should have done. Thank you for uh, your professionalism, Jamie Noble. <sighs> okay, um, certainly a lot better than this next match that we're going to talk about because, folks, I think it's about that time. It's about that time that we talk about one of the worst things in the Ruthless Aggression era. Well, of course, we're talking about Brock Lesnar versus Goldberg. (laughs) There it is. is Screaming that. Since January, they've been hyping up this one-on-one dream match, a what-if match between the Rises the fastest rising star in WWE history, two-time WWE champion Brock Lesnar versus one of the most over, most ferocious, most powerful men in WCW who was in the WWE for one year in Bill Goldberg. Something that has been building since November (laughs) at Survivor Series. We've talked about this build-up before. We talked about No Way Out. The only other factor we need to add in this match is that Lesnar blames Goldberg for losing the WWE Championship. And yeah. like in Zach's great in reenactment he just gave there, <laughs> this is why you don't give Brock Lesnar a microphone. Okay, 
If, if anybody doesn't know what I'm talking about, just search up Brock Lesnar begging promo. It is one of the most unintentionally hilarious promos in history, where he claims that Eddie Guerrero stole my title! <laughs> you know? You don't give Brock Lesnar a microphone. <laughs> this is not Cowboy Lesnar. This is not. This is, you know, as great as Lesnar was in the ring, he, he couldn't talk, and that's why they gave him Paul Heyman to begin with. So when it's... you have Lesnar in one of his only lone promos, you get shit like this. And it was horrible. <laughs> it was so funny, though, wasn't it? Uh, like, yeah, I the, couldn't... <laughs> because of you, factor... Bill! I can't sleep at night! <laughs> and it's so crazy because <laughs> you have this big buildup, and then the last month of this buildup has nothing to do with Lesnar and Goldberg. It's that big man of reluctantly appointed Stone Cold Steve Austin as the special guest referee for this match because Stone Cold was kind of in the middle of this entire thing. Lesnar shows up in Raw, on Raw after Bischoff and who did he wrestle? Bischoff and Vince. Bischoff and Vince. That's right. For some reason, Vince and Bischoff have a match on free TV so that well, Vince can have Austin prove how good of a special referee he can be. Vince and Bischoff brawl to the back. Oh. Good lord, Thanks man. Oh my god, this wasn't on WrestleMania. <sighs> Could you imagine? <laughs> Could you imagine? Um, and back when show invasions were actually exciting, Lesnar storms Raw, he F5 Stone Cold Steve Austin, and he steals his ATV. He sure does. He sure does. That part was good. I liked Brock Lesnar driving the ATV around. Because, uh, I mean, it's no tractor or anything like that. He's not uprooting the ring on SmackDown with an ATV, but... Um, <laughs> Austin... the ATV to SmackDown, and he tells Stone Cold, you want your precious little ATV back? Come to SmackDown and get it. Stone Cold says for the first time in years, he will be on SmackDown to come get his ATV. I love this segment so much. Brock Lesnar re 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 recruits the entire SmackDown locker room to be his bodyguard for Stone Cold Steve Austin. And when Austin comes out, the entire roster realizes, why the fuck are we helping this guy? He is an asshole. He has kicked all of our asses more than once. Let's walk out on him. And, and Austin's, Austin's just going to stun all of us anyway to get to Brock. So, like, what, what good do we get? You know, <laughs> like just a you know, fraction of Brock's of paycheck. Thinking, you know... You, you see all those wrestlers, and they're all thinking, no, 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 no. I've watched Raw in 1998. I know exactly what's going to happen. I'm out of here. Oh, yeah. But, ooh, the plot doth thicken before WrestleMania. So, all this build going on. And the reason why Goldberg disappeared from this build after that hilarious Brock Lesnar promo, which I cannot urge you guys enough to go back and watch in its entirety because it's so funny, and it's so bad, and it's so funny. But, basically... Goldberg, his contract is up. So after Mania, he was out of there. So that's why they were centering the build on Brock and Austin. But the grind of professional wrestling grew to be too much for 25, 26-year-old Brock Lesnar, however old he was at the time. He he was given a private jet so he could travel easier. He doesn't like people. He doesn't like encountering people at the airport. So Vince decided to give him a private jet and a brand spanking new contract. But then he was like, you know what? I'd like to try my hand at the NFL. So Brock is out of there. He gives his two-week notice. So you have two dudes who are wrestling what should be a dream match, and both of them are gone, and the crowd knows it. And they then know. Um, Goldberg's <sighs> official reason for leaving the company, he said in an interview that if you don't know, Goldberg's a big family man, and he loves yep. doing stuff for children. And he said that he did not like the direction WWE was going in. And he wanted to be a part of a more family-friendly product. So he decided to just pack his bags and go home. That Lesnar makes sense. Was on his way to the NFL. Uh, and the fans were not happy. They were fully aware that Goldberg and Lesnar were out the door. And they decided to turn on this match immediately. So Austin comes out. He's given a very respectful ovation. Brock Lesnar is introduced to the ring by Howard Finkel, which is a rarity. You will never hear Howard Finkel introduce Brock Lesnar really ever. Um, Goldberg comes out with that banger of a WWE theme for the first time on this. In. I know, right? It's because so... all of his other matches, they dub it as WCW. It's so good, though. His WWE it version is. is so good. 
It it's, is. And I, I think WWE just wants to distance themselves from that version, but it was a good, like, little remix of his WCW theme. It was. It was honestly more intimidating. Um, it it, call it a hot it take felt, all you want. It, it felt more like Final Boss. Mm-hmm. If, if you turn Goldberg heel, that's the theme you give him for sure. But so if there's one thing that you notice from commentators when it comes to rogue crowds like this, they try to ignore it. But JR and King can't ignore this. So they address it right away. So there have been rumors that Brock Lesnar is leaving the WWE and he's going to try his hand at the National Football League. Yep. And the fans are aware of that. The rumors have been rampant and the fans are letting them know how they feel. They start chanting, you sold out. The God. King says, a sold, a sold out chant from a, sell, a sellout chant from a sold out crowd. I have a question I, I though. Love that how, love does, that line. how does Brock Lesnar sell out if he's leaving for a high paying job in the NFL? Like, how does he do that? <laughs> how does that work? You, is that a double negative? About, if there's one thing I've learned about wrestling fans over the years is that if you leave, they don't fucking like it. They did it to The Rock. Now they're doing it to Lesnar. And how ironic is that? That when Lesnar beat The Rock, they were mad at The Rock for leaving. And two years later, not even, here's Lesnar about to do the same thing. Oh, yeah. The great so, dramatic irony of professional wrestling. They start chanting, na, 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 hey, hey, goodbye at Brock Lesnar. They, here's the thing. <sighs> it wasn't just the crowd that made this match as horrible as it was. How long did it take for Brock Lesnar? Oh, no, no. Before we get to that, Lesnar opens up this match with the greatest thing in the world. <laughs> the bell rings, the camera pans to him, and Lesnar just goes, hey. <laughs> and the, the, the grunt is the grunt is so quiet. Like it's so like like Goldberg does like the typical Goldberg thing, and then Brock responds with that sound. Um, and Ryan also Zane puts it best. He says the bell rings, and Brock Lesnar opens up with. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, the crowd chants Lesnar has made that one is the most underrated. The crowd <laughs> the. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dude, we got to get these Brock Lesnar impressions out while we still can because it's going to be probably a while before we talk about him again. So, um, Stone Cold Steve Austin gets chance and he smiles at the crowd, but you were going to ask me how long it takes these two behemoths to lock up. I I put a stopwatch on when this bell rang. 2 minutes and 46 fucking seconds. I'm sorry for my language, but like Jesus and Christ. This this is not a Rock and Hogan moment. Where no. They're soaking it all. Fans are going crazy. They're looking out at the fans. They do the iconic head switch movement. This is Lesnar and Goldberg literally just staring at each other for over two minutes. And here's the thing. This is a blood feud. Yeah. They are not here to put on a spectacle. They're here to rip each other apart, and they're not doing anything. They're just staring at each other. They're circling around each other. The fans are getting impatient. And the commentators say, like, the fans are getting, you know, a little restless. They want to see these guys rip each other apart. And they're not doing it. And JR is like, starts... why are these two so hesitant? He says it best. You know? Like, <sighs> good I lord. Just feel like the crowd got to them, in my opinion. They got so flustered by this crowd. And this match, I feel like, was booked in a way where the fans were going to be like this. And here's the thing. Lesnar is still only two years into his wrestling career. And Goldberg was not known for wrestling long matches. So I feel like they got stuck in this predicament and they didn't know what to do. They yeah. could have called an audible. Stone Cold Steve Austin sure called an audible at the end of this match. It should have just uh, been spear, jackhammer, screw you, get out of the company, done. Story over. <laughs> Like, now that's all it should have been. would rectify this 13 years later. But we're not talking about Which is about insane. We're talking about 2004. Right. And Austin is more over. They're chanting for Austin. The, the commentators are acknowledging that they're chanting for Austin. The crowd Austin's is chanting. Out of this. The crowd is chanting for Hulk Hogan. The crowd is chanting, we want Brett. Like, anything with these two guys. Um, Goldberg. And finally, they lock up. And they break the lock. And the fans, they went from, like, being, you know, trolling Lesnar and Goldberg to now they're pissed. Yeah. 
And and it's almost like Lesnar and Goldberg were trolling them at this point. And the crowd starts chanting, this match sucks. Uh, Goldberg goes for a spear. He hits the ring post. They go outside for a slow bit. The crowd starts chanting, Goldberg sucks. And then Lesnar looks at the crowd and he's like, yeah, yeah, Goldberg but sucks. Before, before that happens, they do this horrendous sequence where they try to do the, again, this is proof that the match was not supposed to get shit on like this because they do the thing where they throw each other into the ropes and then Goldberg hits a big shoulder block and Lesnar doesn't budge and the fans don't like that. Lesnar gives him a receipt. The fans don't like that. You know, again, Lesnar and Goldberg had no idea what to do, so they stuck with the script. Good Lord, man. I mean, the crowd has... The crowd is just restless. They're begging for death um, around the ending point of this match. Goldberg hits a spear. Lesnar hits an F5 for a two count. And, like, the crowd just wants this match to end so badly. But then, finally, the inevitable occurs. Goldberg hits one more spear and a jackhammer. Screw you, Brock. Screw this match. I, 13 minutes wasted if you watch this. Zero stars. Zero. Zero stars. This yeah. This was infuriating frustrating and you know what if you haven't watched this match a long time or if you've never seen this match take our word for it it's just as bad as everybody says it is. it's one of the you most know, there are matches one of the most Go infamous on. matches in wrestlemania history for sure sorry to cut you off but like no you're it's you know there are bad matches but i feel like even in bad matches there's some redeeming qualities there's nothing redeeming about this match it's and just it's it shouldn't have been like if no. both of these if Brock like if Brock Lesnar for instance in an alternate universe had stayed with the WWE in 2004 chances are Brock probably would have squashed Bill Goldberg here and Austin would have been forced to count the three uh, maybe Brock moves to Raw in the draft lottery and him and Austin continue feuding but again that's like that's fantasy booking for you there I can't really like go off of that too much but this match should have been the big Haas fight that everybody was wanting out of these two. When Goldberg so, came into the company, his match against Lesnar was the match everybody wanted. But now that both guys were out and these guys were, you know, just basically trolling the audience by following the script, of course it's going to be terrible. Of course the crowd is going to be mad because it's not what they expected, you know? No. So earlier I said Stone Cold Steve Boston called an audible, and he did after the match. Lesnar was pissed. He knew he was out of the company, so he flipped off the crowd, and he flipped off Stone Cold. Stone Cold was never supposed to stun Goldberg and Lesnar after this match, but he saw what a train wreck of it was, and he had to send, he had to make the fans happy somehow. So how do you make them happy? You give everybody a stunner. He stuns yes. Lesnar literally out of the WWE. JR says that, but then he catches himself at the end and says, out of a WWE ring. You know how badly JR wanted to say he just stunned Lesnar right out of the WWE? If he would have said that, Lesnar probably would have hunted him down and killed him. See you in 2012, you stupid son of a bitch. <laughs> so Goldberg comes in to share Steve Weiser with Austin, and this is where I said the audible comes in. He was never supposed to stun Goldberg, but he had no choice to. The fans were pissed. He had to send them home happy. <laughs> this crowd. This, this, so Austin salutes the crowd with the Steve Weisers. They, they cheer him. Goldberg does the same thing, and the crowd gives him, like, the most negative response. Like, you son of a bitch. How dare you impersonate Stone Cold like that? You know, it's... Uh, In this yeah. retrospective, I hope you enjoyed the ride, everybody. Because we will not be talking about Brock Lesnar in the retrospective. I'm sure we'll be talking about him in the current product. But we will not be talking about him for another eight years. Jesus, man. I'm like... <laughs> Brock Lesnar uh... would fail in the NFL. Not even make it past the practice squad for the Minnesota mm -hmm. Vikings. And I'm sure Zach has a lot more uh, facts and information on that than I would. But yep. as we all know, he would move on to Ultimate Fighting Championship. Where he would become a star in there. You know, becoming such a badass fire. Winning Beat Randy Couture in only his, like, third or fourth fight. Um, but, yeah. Um, he would go off, you know, he would even keep a little bit of his professional wrestling intact. And he would cut scathing promos after his UFC fights. Uh, promos that would get him into some hot water. Because I think he was being sponsored by Bud Light. And he said, I'm going to go home and drink a Budweiser. Bud Light sucks. He got him so much hot water for that. 
he had to apologize during a press conference because you don't insult your sponsor like that and expect them to keep sponsoring you. I'm going to go so, home and eat Jimmy John sandwiches. Jimmy John sucks. I'm going to go to Jersey exactly. Mike's. Exactly. <laughs> You know? Exactly. So Lesnar would continue to remain relevant in those eight years as well because he was brought up constantly. There was rumors of TNA wanting to bring him in. There was always that rumor or that thought like, what if WWE brought him back? And Lesnar always said he has no interest in going back into WWE. You know, 2012 is a long way from now. So we're going to talk about this now while it's still uh, relevant. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean... With the jersey number Brock Lesnar was wearing on the Minnesota Vikings, how how could you not cut him? I mean, it was a 69. It was nice, you know? Just to go look it up. Let's go look it up. Brock Lesnar wore 69 Wait. on the football field. Did he and Roman Reigns, were they both on the same practice squad? I don't think they were. I don't think they were. Okay. I know no. they both were. They they were both trying to play for the Vikings, and I know they were both on the practice squad, but... uh. I don't think Roman Reigns like tried to get into football until like a few years after Brock did. So, but that was the funniest meme I saw our WrestleMania weekend in San Jose is that they put up a picture, they put up a pictures of Lesnar and Reigns as a part of the Viking squad, and the say said Roman Reigns versus Brock Lesnar, Lesnar loser goes back to the Minnesota Vikings. Oh jeez, oh jeez, I don't think like you say that like the Minnesota Vikings would be better with either one of them, but. <laughs> You know, <laughs> I'm I'm not um, really in uh, I'm not really in any position to talk with uh, my team starting Geno Smith uh, on Monday Night Football. So, anyhow, <clears throat> yeah, Brock, see you bye for a while. Um, Goldberg, see you bye for another twelve years. <laughs> fuck, dude. And anyhow, we talk about Goldberg the better. Mm -hmm. Anywho, we're trudging along. We are only a little halfway over this show, and this is when I noticed. Maybe there was a match or two too much on this show. Or maybe Goldberg it's and Brock another... went too long. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, it's another sudden death fatal four way match for the WWE tag team titles on SmackDown. It's Rikishi and Scotty to hide defending against the world's greatest tag team, the Basham brothers and the APA. Excuse you. Like it. Excuse you. The self-proclaimed world's greatest tag team as Tony Chimble announced Thank them. Thank you very much. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, this Farouk, the Farouk was hobbling around. I don't know if you noticed that, but he did not look like he was in the best shape. Bradshaw worked the majority of the match for the APA. Uh, there was some nice Samoan drops that he was taking from Rikishi. Uh, the Basham brothers, the Basham brothers were there. I mean, uh, this would be At also all four tag teams participated in this match. Yeah, no, it was it was fun for the time it was given. What six minutes? Yeah, <laughs> six um, minutes. Shelton Benjamin takes a fucking nasty clothesline from hell from Bradshaw. Oh, it was so good, wasn't it? It was. My uh, my uh, my likeness knew how to deliver a clothesline, that's for sure. <laughs> you know? Um, it's after that, like you said, uh, the clothesline from hell. No, it wasn't the Benjamin. I think it was the Doug Basham. But Doug takes the clothesline from hell. Rikishi comes in with the Samoan drop. He sees Doug. He goes over to him. Drops the big ass on him for the pin. Just sits on him. Um, yeah, two stars. This was fun. Yeah, yeah. You know, it was it was serviceable. Two stars, maybe two and a quarter, if I'm being generous. But um, <clears throat> it's Rikishi and Scotty celebrate after the bell. Um, there's fireworks going water. off on the roof. Yeah, which I know you love. Pardon? Which I know you love the worm. <sighs> well, I I don't mind the dance move. I just hate the finisher. Don't like the finisher. And, you know, again, we're eight matches in. The crowd is a little tired, so let's have let's have, let's have a little fun. Rikishi yeah, to let's have a little fun. fun. You know, um, uh, there is a uh, a hype promo package before the next match, uh, promoting the return of Edge after his year long neck injury. Uh, stay tuned for our backlash review next yeah. month. Um, but here's the thing: we're not going to see Edge like for another few months. Like, they're advertising him, like, a little too soon. No way. No, he wrestled Kane at Backlash. He does? Oh, he, he does. He does. Yeah, he comes back, like, he comes back with a neck injury. He's drafted to Raw, and he has the cast, right? You know uh, what I'm thinking of? I'm thinking of his return to Toronto at SummerSlam, where he gets booed out of the building. For some reason, I thought that's when he returned. And when I saw that promo, I'm like, a little too soon to be advertising him. But you're right, he does wrestle Kane at yeah. the next pay-per-view. 
Mm hmm. Yeah, no, that's that's going to be an interesting one to uh, go through, my friends, when we get there. But next up for the women's championship, Victoria defending against Molly Holly with a stipulation that if Molly Holly loses, she gets her head shaved bald. Now, here is the sad truth about this match. And Victoria has said it go in ahead. promos. Vince did not want this match to happen. He refused to let the women's title be on the show. Poor Victoria For and some poor reason. Molly Holly. Yeah, poor what Victoria the hell? and poor Molly Holly had to basically beg Vince to put this match on the show, and Molly and Victoria got together and said, what if the loser shaves their head? And that was the only way Vince could put this match on the show. And Molly volunteered to have her head shaved to get the women's title represented on this card. So, Less than kudos to Molly Holly. You know? You know what I hated about this match? And it the commentary. The commentary. The commentary... But the commentary that actually leads into my next point, why the fuck is Molly Holly's gimmick is that she's ugly? If you think Molly Holly is ugly, you need to get your head examined, son. She was hot. Yeah, no, she was, yeah. So, um, no, my problem was, like, her gimmick was that, like, JR and the King were treating her like a virgin. Like, <laughs> bro. <laughs> Different product in 2004, my friends. Um, and, and then, and then Victoria. Uh, it's, it, it's good to know here that she's actually a white hot baby face at this point with the women's title. And she uh, comes out to lady. that it's a fire theme song too, which is so good. She, uh, they I'm dub over Deadlock it. If you weren't a, if you weren't watching wrestling when Victoria had that theme, then you missed out. On, you missed out because mm -hmm. there's literally no other way to relive that unless you have the DVDs or you find some YouTube videos. Because oh. WWE has gone out of their way to make sure that theme is completely wiped off. You can find it on YouTube for sure. It's absolutely there. I've heard it, but but also yeah. you have to live through it. Mm hmm. Oh, I lived through it. Both both of Victoria's title reigns. Yep. I remember when I heard Victoria's theme, loving it, and then when I was in the car with my mom driving somewhere, it came on the radio, and I got so excited. I'm like, fuck, it's Victoria's theme song. <laughs> oh, also, man. Also, Victoria, she was, she, she, she was in the wrong era. I would love to see Victoria. This Victoria in today's <clears throat> environment. Oh, man, she would be so dominant, wouldn't she? I'd she love would. to see her mix it up with Charlotte. I'd love to see her mix it up with Bailey. I'd love to see her mix it up with, you know, with, uh, God, who else? Yes. Becky Lynch, Both Bianca Belair. You know, like it's just I know yeah. Victoria it comes back here and there, and I know she's a lot happier and where she is in life, but it's just it's a shame. It's just put her in the Hall of Fame. Put her in the Hall of Fame. Yes, she deserves yes, it. Yes, please. Um, but in any case, um there is a uh there's a nice sunset flip power bomb off the top. Um, but the ending is basically Molly trying to steal Victoria's finisher, which is my favorite trope in wrestling, stolen finishers. It backfires. Victoria gives her a backslide and scores the surprise pinfall. Molly knows what this means. She tries to run away. And you have the classic hair versus hair gimmick with the with the cowardly heel trying to run away. It's Kurt Angle and Edge all over again, basically. Molly tries without to shave Victoria's hold. head. Pardon? Without the sleeper hold. Yeah, without the sleeper hold. Yeah. Um, and Molly is trapped in the chair and there you go. Victoria shaves Molly bald right over there on the stage. Um, I mean, kudos to these two for, uh, you know, sacrificing what they did to get on this show. Um, it was, it was a solid little match too. I mean, it wasn't like, you know, going to set the world on fire or anything like that, but, um, it's certainly you not know, up there in terms of like quality, like Bianca and Becky at last year's mania. <laughs> Um, you would have shaved, ah, see what I did there, shaved six minutes off of Goldberg and Lesnar and given it to the ladies, it would have been nice. But they didn't do that, did they? They didn't do that. How um, disrespectful. This goes into a very awkward transition because they need to kill time while they do this head shaving thing. Um, they play the hype package for the next upcoming match. It's Eddie Guerrero versus Kurt Angle for the WWE Championship. Not only, we're going to get into the match in a second, but this build was absolutely amazing. Like we talked about, at No Way Out, Angle won a triple threat match to become number one contender for the WWE Championship. But Angle would go on to attack Eddie Guerrero on an episode of SmackDown. And when he's asked why he did it, he says that he is ashamed 
to have Eddie Guerrero represented the WWE's champion. He is a liar. He's a cheater. He, you know, should not be representing this company. And Angle is doing this from his home in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, just absolutely running down Eddie. Eddie says that he is proud who he is. He's never going to apologize. Paul Heyman does demand an apology from Eddie Guerrero, but Eddie says that he's not going to apologize. He loves who he is. And this is, again, an oh. amazing promo from Eddie. When yeah. He, well, at first, at know, first, I remember this right promo. Right Eddie, Eddie at first tells Paul Heyman, I'm sorry, Holmes. And then later on, uh, he's like, guess what? I lied, Holmes. <laughs> I loved when Eddie would do that. You know. um Heyman says I wish I was in a position to kick your ass right now and Eddie goes are you serious you couldn't beat me if both hands were tied behind my back Heyman says are you being serious when you say that so he books himself in a match with Eddie Eddie has to have both hands tied behind his back and oh my god Heyman they're handcuffed he says, yeah so he says we think you'd be a little more comfortable if you were handcuffed and yeah. that was another point angle made that Eddie is a drug addict and he cannot be WWE champion because he is a former drug addict. Um, so Eddie and Heyman have their little match. Heyman runs away, and out comes Kurt Angle. God. And he has this look in his eyes like he is going to kill somebody. And Michael Cole, with a great call, he says, oh, no, Eddie Guerrero's still handcuffed. Like, fearing for Eddie's life. And the, Eddie Eddie sold it really well, too. Like, he knew what was about to, sh about to happen. And Angle just perceives to beat the living hell out of Eddie. And one thing I also appreciated Eddie as a face is that he's taking this beating like a man. And mm -hmm. he gets up and he tells Angle, you know what? Give me your best shot. And Angle takes that WWE Championship belt and he nails Eddie in the head with it. This is my favorite Kurt Angle. The vicious ass kicker wrestling machine Kurt Angle. And with a little sprinkle of delusional heel in there. Because when other people ask him, well, why are you attacking Eddie like this? I'm going to win the WWE championship for all of you. And he still thinks he's the good guy in this situation, which he's not obviously, but in his mind, he is that's justifiable villainous actions. Great. Absolutely phenomenal. But ironically, Kurt Angle is making his entrance as Molly Holly's head shaving is completed. And he looks over and he's like, yeah, I've been there. I know how it feels. <laughs> It's so great. So great. And Eddie can Guerrero I just... makes his entrance in one of his custom lowrider trucks. I loved the lowrider so much. I loved them so much that as a kid, I told myself I wanted hydraulics when I grew up. But <sighs> then you look at how much those cost and you realize you're never going to have hydraulics as, as long as you live. Him and his iconic Scarface spoof t-shirt as well with the Undisputed Championship on his shoulder. This match was freaking fantastic, guys. Um, just... I know a lot of people remember this WrestleMania for the main event and how the show ended. Go back and watch Eddie and Kurt tear it up. These two really, really clicked on this night. Um, the storytelling, the psychology, the chemistry between these two was, was just beyond perfection. This is a top 100. If I would ever compile a top 100 matches of all time, this would easily be on like, the higher tier of matches just <laughs> for sure like and you watch if you sit down and just pay attention to the match from start to finish it starts <clears throat> off with kurt angle and eddie guerrero just this perfect chain wrestling and it's a human chess match and you see that eddie knows he's not as good of a grappler as angle but he knows he's on his level and he is kind of matching up angle pretty well with these grapples and he's back it's so back and forth too eddie hits one of the three amigos kurt counters with one of the three german suplexes in that hat trick um there's a point where they're on the apron and kurt tries a german suplex off the apron to the floor uh some very very uncomfortable commentary to listen to in hindsight where taz is like kurt don't do it you're gonna kill him and i'm like uh, yeah. don't don't say that, man. <laughs> don't say that. He hits a nice running drop kick to the outside. Angle kind of started working on the ribs before this point, but this is where the heat really got on them. Eddie goes to the top rope. He goes for a flying nothing, and he crashes ribs first into that barricade. That looked like it hurt. Angle throws oh, yeah. Eddie back in the ring, and he immediately starts working on those ribs. He's got flying the nothing. stretch on him. Again, stall line from other wrestling commentators. <laughs> um, and he gets thrown back in the ring, and that's where Angle really starts zeroing on those ribs. He's got an abdominal stretch on him. 
He's got a back wrestling hold where he is just squeezing the life out of Eddie's ribs. Mm. This match is just sheer perfection. It's great wrestling. Uh, Kurt goes for an angle slam and Eddie with a Lucha Libre style counter into an arm drag and a head scissors. Um, and that's what Michael Cole was putting over on commentary. Um, he doesn't really think that Eddie can out wrestle angles. So he's going to have to stay aerial and in, uh, invest in that Lucha Libre style offense to, uh, get one over on him. But one thing that they didn't exactly, you know, angle slam countered into a DDT, which is awesome. Uh, I mean, Angle, great playing possum as well, uh, right into the ankle lock. And he was in the ankle lock for so freaking long. Um, and that leads this into is... an incredible finish, Tomas. Yeah. And like I said, this plays excellently into the storytelling and the psychology that these two have. Again, so Eddie is in this ankle lock for a very long time, and he starts unlacing his boot. And when Angle notices that he's unlacing his, or he kind of clutching the ankle, again, like a shark smelling blood in the water. And he gets this evil look on his face. And then Eddie starts playing up the fear factor again. And he notices it. And he kind of like puts on a facade of like, oh no, Angle. He, oh no, don't go for my ankle. Don't anything but that. You and could you could audibly see Eddie Guerrero say, oh shit, on camera too, which yeah. is great. Um, and Which the is- commentators are putting over, oh, yeah, that boot must be pretty tight. So Eddie's trying to relieve some tension in that hurt foot. Uh, so Kurt goes back in, locks in the ankle lock one more time on that loose shoe. Eddie kicks the boot. It goes flying. And there's an inside cradle. And he pins Kurt Angle to retain the WWE Championship. Oh, my God. It was so good. And I was so happy. Like, even though Kurt was one of my favorite wrestlers at the time, I was so happy to see Eddie win this. Um, and the fact... Start. This was amazing. I'm going to go four and three quarter. I think this match was, this was that great. My only regret in this match, and at, we will get into this as we get into more Eddie's reign, this is Eddie's only definitive, successful championship defense. Yeah. Can you believe that? It's Can you believe that? Egregious. Egregious, isn't it? Should have held that title at least until SummerSlam. At least. Um, but there yeah. weren't really a whole lot this of... Was- great heels on SmackDown were there. No. No. But um Eddie and Angle would uh you know circle back to each other and they would wrestle each other again at SummerSlam. An excellent match there. More on that later though, that is another excellent build. But this was just again, Mm -hmm. if you're a wrestling fan and you haven't watched this match, you owe it to yourself. Eddie also used the Eddie also lied cheat and steal using the ropes for leverage as well. Um which is (laughs) <laughs> so in I character I always say I'm not a fan of small package victories but just the way it was played into was sheer perfection and it wasn't just a small package I feel like when Eddie grabbed Angle it was kind of a fisherman buster into that small package did you notice that oh yeah oh it was so incredible man um, my only thing and yeah some people have nitpicked about this already Eddie should have sold that ankle legitimately to put over the ankle lock as a finisher. But Michael Cole was like, wait a minute. There's nothing wrong with Eddie's ankle. You're telling me that the ankle lock is a fake hold. Then <laughs> like, you know, it's oh boy. Nah, that that's you just me guys. This is a very long card. And <sighs> if you've stuck with us long enough through here, there's a light at the end of the tunnel, but we have two more matches to talk about. What do we have next? Including one of the most anticipated stories going into WrestleMania 20. Undertaker versus Kane. Or, if you look at the graphic, Kane facing a big, gigantic black cross. Um, This is dating all the way back to Survivor Series. Kane buried the American badass alive. And the following, I believe it was the following Raw. Because Kane was on Raw at this point. And it was a very strict brand split. Uh, He delivers a eulogy for his brother. And it's, you know, I did it because I hated what my brother had become. One of you. And it's one of those promos, you know? It's like, you people. Undertaker became one of you. Um, He obviously alluded to the fact that Undertaker stopped being the dead man and he became the American badass. And he didn't like how Undertaker basically humanized himself. How ironic that this would lead into what happened here. As we all know, Kane buried The Undertaker alive at Survivor Series 2004. And I want to say probably a couple of months after that, we started getting these eerie promos on Raw and SmackDown. 
Mm -hmm. very sacrilegious promos of a cross a graveyard that throne is embedded in my mind for the rest of my life they said somebody was coming uh as we know undertaker uh distracted kane at the royal rumble to get him eliminated from the match and then that's when it came apparent undertaker announced that he would be returning at wrestlemania uh he's really playing the mind games on kane at this point i totally forgot that undertaker made the ring move and they built hydraulics into the ring to kind of make it oh, rock yeah. back and forth. Like it's a freaking... Uh, you have rain falling... House. You have rain falling on Kane on the entrance ramp as he's screaming, My brother is dead! 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 <laughs> like, and it's... Uh, and let Kane, me tell you, for Kane having to sell this whole program by himself, he did a damn good job. Say what you want about Kane right now. My least favorite version of him is currently on Twitter. But the thing is, like... <sighs> he did there. He was so incredible in this build. Like, the fact that he had to do this, exactly what you said, all by himself to build up The Undertaker's return and basically reacts to all of these grandiose special effects, it's brilliant. Absolutely brilliant what he did there in terms of storytelling. He comes out with a towel on his head, the signature, like, unmasked cane towel. The LEDs behind him in the skyline are burning, of course. Um... But then you get uh, probably- Jerry Lawler with the stupid line. Oh my God. Oh, the buildings are on fire. Cause he says that like three or four more times at WrestleMania. I'm like, Oh, give it a rest. King. It, it becomes a Kane signature. That's for sure. But man, this, you, you tell, you told me the story about how you were glued to the TV screen when the undertaker was coming out. Oh my God. So when undertaker got buried alive, which I watched live as well, I was distraught as a kid. I was heartbroken. And I thought The Undertaker was gone for so long when in reality, he was only gone for five months. Mm -hmm. And when he finally made his return here, I'm at my goddad's house. He ordered the pay-per-view. Like I said, we had like a bunch of family and friends who would bring their kids over and they were like on and off of the pay-per-view. No, from start to finish, I was watching it. And when Undertaker made his entrance, I remember telling everyone to be quiet. I sat two inches from the TV screen because I couldn't believe it. I needed to see it with my own eyes. The Druids come out. Paul Bear comes out. Mm-hmm. And here is the return of the dead man. And it was so cool. That was my first exposure to Dead Man Undertaker personally. Like growing up, like I had the VHS tapes and all that, but I was like, this is the past. Undertaker now is this biker. I didn't think I was going to get this version of Taker really ever and the fact that he comes out with the druids and with paul bear and all that like it's probably to me top five wrestlemania entrance of all time if not top three it is that iconic you know it's the spectacle of it is something i'll never forget um this is another interpromotional match because like we said kane is on raw undertaker is still on smackdown of this and i like the consistency uh, they easily could have moved Taker for Raw, but at the same time, SmackDown still needed big stars, and I'm glad that Undertaker stuck with SmackDown technically until the end. Especially um, in 2004, SmackDown certainly needed those big stars, but Kane again is in disbelief as the crowd is just in awe and just chanting at the Undertaker, and he is screaming at him, "You're not real." <laughs> And I vividly remember him saying that specifically. And my dad was impersonating Kane as we were uh, watching this pay-per-view live. I remember him screaming, you're not real, Undertaker. <laughs> like, Kane's it's... selling of this, again, absolutely amazing. And as <clears throat> I was watching this match, Kane, this was the first time anyone ever intimidated this, like, you know, rendition of Kane, this version of Kane, because all the evil stuff we've seen him done since he unmasked, uh, torturing Shane McMahon, torturing RVD, uh, tombstoning old women on the stage, which I know you were a fan of. Oh, especially Linda McMahon? Yes. was (laughs) kind of poetic justice that finally Kane, you know, he was not the hunter, he was the hunted. Mm -hmm. Well, he would continue to do some evil stuff in 2004, as we'll continue with, but... I mean, this is definitely the comeuppance. And Paul Bearer even saying at ringside, you're no son of mine. How do you like that, boy? <laughs> like, You know, you it's know, in all great. intents and purposes, Paul Bearer really had nothing to do with this. But 
I no. care. I'm glad he was there. <laughs> oh yeah, it it added so much to the return and it like. Did. It's kind of like when they ran it back in 2010, even though that feud was horrible. You know, I didn't care. Whenever Paul Bearer wants to be part of The Undertaker, I'm all for that shit. Remember, guys, burying The Undertaker alive could not put The Undertaker into a coma, but it took 33 years total for Kane to beat The Undertaker into a coma. <laughs> we'll get there. We'll yes. get there, I'm sure. But, I mean, the match itself really was nothing special honestly um in terms of wrestling like this was nowhere near their match at wrestlemania 14 doesn't hold a candle to that but just the spectacle and the awe of seeing the dead man back in 2004 was just something else kane hits taker with a choke slam taker sits up as kane is celebrating taker hits one of his own um and the crowd is chanting for a tombstone um because if you remember, Taker's finisher for all this time through the retrospective was the last run. But this crowd wanted a tombstone because that's the classic Undertaker finisher there. And sure enough, he hits Kane with it, pins him 1-2-3, 12-0 at WrestleMania. Um, and this is where they really started to put over the streak as being something really, really prestigious at WrestleMania. Um, um, the match, again, it's nothing all that special. I'm going to give it two and a half stars. As a kid, I thought this was amazing, and the spectacle in the moment of Undertaker returning is still amazing, but the match, I mean, nothing really to write home about. Let me put it this way. It's a two-and-a-half-star match with a five-star spectacle. Nice. Um, You know, it's that entrance and that return is something I'll never forget as long as I live, and watching it live was just, it was even better, even better. Undertaker is the greatest of all time. I don't care what anybody says. He's the greatest to ever do it. In awe as a kid throughout this entire thing. I feel like, of course, what we're going to talk about next was awesome in its own right. But I feel like as a kid, this would uh, this is what I was looking forward to the most at that WrestleMania. Mm -hmm. So our main event. Um, here we very, go. Very, very important match here, Tomas. What is it? It's for the World Heavyweight Championship. It is Royal Rumble winner Chris Benoit. Challenging Triple H, and we have another added factor into this, Shawn Michaels. How in the we hell do we this. get here? <laughs> At the Royal Rumble, they went to a double countout in the last man standing match. Oh, Shawn Michaels still felt like he was owed a title match. Last man standing match. Last month at No Way, at no way Out, Benoit jumped shit to Monday Night Raw when he won the Royal Rumble because Triple H was egging him on. He was saying that Benoit doesn't have the balls to come over to Monday Night Raw and challenge him for the title. So Benoit said that he came over to Raw. He wanted to challenge for the championship. But this is, you know, Shawn Michaels is my favorite wrestler of all time. This is yeah. where I feel like he got a little greedy, though. He didn't win the championship, so he crashed the contract signing, and he is basically demanding to be put in the match. I look at that and go, Michaels, it's not... You don't, no more shots hits, for you, Michaels. Like, hits Chris Benoit with a sweet chin music and basically turns Chris Benoit into a human bobblehead. Like, the way Benoit sold that super kick was, like, amazing. I don't care what anybody says. It was so good. Um, I mean, especially after, you know, Chris Benoit took the bet like a Cody Rhodes would nowadays, and he goes and challenges Triple H. I'll take that bet, challenge you for the big gold belt, ending racism along the way, I'm sure. Um, and then he basically, you know, I, I'm sorry, but he, uh, yeah, Shawn Michaels is offended that Chris Benoit would take his world title match away. What world title match, Shawn? You didn't earn it. You didn't win the title at the Rumble. So you have no business here. So he takes matters into his own hands, signs the contract, and, uh, we have a triple threat match as, uh, decreed by Sheriff Austin. So this thing to me. The greatest triple threat match of all time. You can take it's... your you can take your rock angle taker at vengeance. You can take your Lesnar Cena Rollins at Rumble 15. This is the best one. You know, I really appreciated how we got our technical masterpiece with Eddie and Angle. And there was some really good wrestling in this match, but this was about the drama. This was about the storytelling. And this was just, you know, a spectacle. This match from start to finish was absolutely amazing. Everybody got their stuff in. Uh, Benoit, you know, was the daring underdog. Shawn Michaels is the 
is the veteran out with a chip on his shoulder. And he's the desperate veteran. Yeah. He's got a chip on his shoulder for sure. Triple H is, you know, we, we've talked about Triple H enough. He is the, the greedy, power-hungry World Heavyweight Champion that's going to do whatever it takes to retain this title. One thing I will give this match, no evolution interference. And nope. thank you for that. No evolution interference because they already had a match. Uh, Shawn Michaels, uh, man... Man, he was out of this world in this thing, wasn't he? Um, he takes a he slingshot. He did not need to go this hard in this match, but he did. Takes a slingshot from Ben Juan. You can tell that Michaels is doing something to his forehead because once he hits that slingshot, there's blood everywhere. Shawn Michaels bladed so hard. Like, he didn't really need to because the story was more so about Ben Juan being elevated to the top. But, man, man, did this add so much. So good. Yeah, this, and again, this, I mean, this match had its really good wrestling spots as well. I feel like just everyone got to duke it out. Everybody, you know, we got some really classic pairings. Benoit and Michaels, you don't see that too often. Nope. Throughout this this run. They never really had a one-on-one match either, did they? Um, No. Yeah, it's crazy to think about it that way. Uh, Benoit also comes out. uh, Howard Finkel announces him as now residing in Atlanta, Georgia. Why not just introduce him as from Edmonton? Like, did he, like, was it because Vince was putting the title on him? Because, Zach, Canada bad. (laughs) Other country bad. Oh, my God. Americans good, Canada bad. (laughs) When are you going to understand that? I know he had that house in Atlanta by this point, probably, but, like, (laughs) you could just announce it. You could just bill him from Edmonton. Why not, you know? Um, Again, they Benoit, did the same thing with Jericho. <laughs> man, <laughs> born and raised York. in Manhasset, New York. <laughs> you know, Canada come on, bad. guys. When you turn heel again, then you will be Canada. But when you're a baby face, no, 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 Canada bad. That's that's a TNA gimmick right there. Uh, Do you Canada think bad. Vince hated Canada so much is because of what happened with Bret Hart? Oh. <laughs> Do you think that's where all this unbridled hatred for Canada? One hundred percent. Benoit locks in the sharpshooter on Triple H, and the crowd pops so loud. And the sharpshooter was never Benoit's finisher, but the crowd was buying into that, that Benoit could have won with that thing, you know? I don't think people appreciate Triple H's selling as much as they should, because Triple H is just shaking his head like it's nobody's business when he's in this sharpshooter. Yeah. (laughs) You want to talk about human bobbleheads? Yeah. Match really kicks into high gear when they make their way to the outside. They're battling on the announce table, and then the unthinkable happens. They have Benoit in a position, and Triple H and Michaels kind of look at each other, and they just kind of silently agree, let's do this. They slam Benoit into the announce table, and that is just one of one of the hardest announce table spots I've ever seen. Oh, it's so good, isn't it? It's, it's just so clean. Image of Benoit's lifeless body on the announce table. It's smeared with blood. And it's just, that's when you knew man. this match was kicked into a high, a new gear. Freaking incredible, man. Uh, Michaels hits Triple H with a flying elbow. Uh, Benoit comes in out of nowhere and saves the matchup. And JR is like, how in the hell is Benoit still in this? Um, Benoit hits Are a flying the point. Go ahead. No. Um, Benoit locks in the cross face on Michaels, and then right before he taps out, Triple H makes the save and grabs oh, Michaels. Oh, that was so good. Oh, that was amazing. Michaels was about to tap to the cross face, and Triple H made sure that that didn't happen. He ensured. Which I love oh. because Triple H could have just broken it up, but I just love that drama of him diving and grabbing the hand. Like, no, you're not going to tap out. Not like, because inches. I don't want you to tap out. It's because I'm going to lose the title if you tap out. Inches away from tapping out, too. Uh, I forgot to mention when, uh, so Benoit had hit the flying headbutt on Michaels earlier on when he has triple H locked in the sharpshooter, Michaels breaks it up via sweet chin music. And it's wonderful. Absolutely wonderful. Uh, th- there's that point where Michaels Super tries kick? to pin both guys in the triple threat match trope and both guys successfully kick out. Super kicks are a dime a dozen nowadays. <laughs> Everybody does them, but nobody threw a super kick like Shawn Michaels. Because he hit that super kick like his life depended on it. Yeah. Hey, Dolph Ziggler. Dolph Ziggler, eat your heart out. 
You hear me? No thigh slapping. <laughs> he just threw that boot like it was it was gonna save his life. Man. And dude. again, the sell because you know, you hit that move and you think, why doesn't he go for the pin? This Michael selling is just so amazing. He hit that and I was like, that's it. That's the last move he could ever hit in this match. But no. Because his body just hits the floor and he is lifeless. Benoit hitting German suplexes everywhere. Triple H did not hit a pedigree, by the way. No pedigree to be seen, which is insane. Then we go into the greatest finish. Yeah, I'm going to say it. The greatest finish in WrestleMania history. Michaels is sent outside to the ring for Benoit. Benoit uses this time to trash talk, which you're thinking, why would he do that when you're so this deep into the match? And then I remember as a kid, I see Triple H and I think, shit, he's going to hit the pedigree and he's going to win. But how cool would it be if Benoit reversed it? So he kicks him, sets up for the pedigree, and in the cleanest reversal I've ever seen in my life, out of the yeah. out of it, he twists the arm, he slaps on the cripple or cross face, and this is the most antagonizing couple minutes I've ever seen as a kid. Man, the time froze when he was in that cross face. Man, Triple H was in that hold for a while too. Blood dripping out of his face. He was hit. He had hit the ring post earlier and bladed himself because it's a world heavyweight title match involving Triple H. Of course, he's gonna bleed. Um, so Benoit has him in this cross face for God knows how long he's Hunter scratching and clawing, trying to get out of this, but he's got no choice but to tap. And, uh, it was almost as if time stood still for a minute when triple H was tapping out. I was the happiest little kid because Benoit was, I mean, he was so close so many times and Jr. even said it continent after continent, mile after mile, country after country. Benoit's 18-year odyssey has come true here. Um, I love that line so much. And in the perfect camera shot, after Benoit wins the title, you'll never forget that image of him on his knees crying as the referee presents him the title. He's celebrating. He climbs on the top rope. He was crying as Hunter was tapping out. As, yeah. As Benoit is climbing down the ropes, the camera zooms out, and there's Eddie Guerrero. And yeah. Eddie Guerrero has tears in his eyes. He gives Benoit an applause. They hug it out. There's confetti falling down. Benoit as the World Heavyweight Champion. Eddie as the WWE Champion. What better WrestleMania finish could you ask for? Dude, I had tears in my eyes re-watching this. I mean, I didn't it's... have the same emotion as I did when I first saw it for obvious reasons. But, I mean, just those two guys in the ring together as the World Champions... Two guys that Vince McMahon would have never put the world titles on, like two, three years prior to this, and here they are. This is this is what I meant by changing of the guard. By the way, it really felt like a whole new era in sports entertainment because these were two it's, pro wrestlers who had been working for this moment, and there you they think are. Think of Chris Benoit and Eddie Guerrero holding the titles, raising their arms in the air as confetti co- comes down. That is one of the most iconic shots in wrestling history. And it will never be shown ever again. It will never be put in WWE signature ever again. And the man who worked so hard to get to this point, unfortunately, is the man responsible for that. So, yeah, it's a damn show. We can celebrate Eddie Guerrero's title win. We can celebrate his title run all we want. Um, but there's still that other half that in all in hindsight should be celebrated, but it can't be celebrated. Chris Benoit winning the Rumble from number one. Chris Benoit winning the world title here. A pretty good world title reign that we'll get into. None of that can ever be celebrated. And it's it sucks. Yeah. It, it really, really it's sucks. A shame. But it's a damn shame. It's it, a this to tragedy. me. It's, yeah. This to yeah. me is the most emotional WrestleMania ending of my childhood. I will never forget it as long as I live. It's probably the best WrestleMania ending of any in the Ruthless Aggression era, if I'm being honest. Um, You know, I mean, and that's all to cap off what I think is the best triple threat match in WrestleMania history. In wrestling history, five stars easily. The drama, the wrestling, the payoff, the storytelling, Triple H and Shawn Michaels reluctantly teaming up to take out this outsider who is a humongous underdog that the crowd is so behind. You know... As a kid, you, 
this main event had everything I ever could have asked for. My favorite wrestler of all time, my least favorite wrestler losing. And as big as a Michaels fan I was, I still liked Benoit. And he was an underdog. And it was nice to see him get what he deserved in winning mm-hmm. his title. Oh, for sure. You know, when you're a kid watching wrestling, you're going to cheer for whoever the good guy is. So, of course, I was happy. But I think Benoit winning the title kind of solidified me as a fan because, you know, I knew Benoit was there. Uh, I cheered for him regardless. But after he won this title and after the one he had, the run he had, he was cool at the time. Yeah. And he would carry that title for a good chunk of 2004, my friend. Uh, and we're going to continue. Note, Go ahead. I think this match and this finish made me realize how much of a banger his theme song was. <laughs> oh, shout out to Our Lady Peace, the people who are providing the theme song to Clash at the Castle. Uh, and Tomas, I told Tomas that, and he was like, What? <laughs> what? <laughs> Come again? That's, I mean, Triple, yeah. H is, Triple H is bringing the rock anthems back for these pay per views, which is a good thing to see. Um, But WrestleMania 20, to me, is always going to be one of the more memorable of my childhood. Uh, It's a hard one to rate, though, um, because you have so much good stuff on this card. The world title matches, for sure, are worth the price. You have a very fun, entertaining handicap match. Jericho and Christian is a fantastic story. Undertaker's return is such a spectacle. But then you also have shit. Goldberg and Lesnar. You know? Horrible. Tag team battle four way for the Raw tag titles. A decent match with Big Show and Cena. Uh, the definition of filler with that Playboy Evening Gown match. A cruiserweight title match that was way too rushed. Mm-hmm. A women's title match that should have been given more time. Yeah, it's a very mixed bag for sure. It's not up there with WrestleMania 17 or 19 for me. Um, seven and three quarters, maybe. You know what? Is that fair? We had two really good main events and the spectacle that was Taker and Engel with the handicap match. I'm comfortable giving it an eight. Okay. All right. You know, I mean, I think there's too much filler for me to give it an eight, but like, I think that's this my rate. My rating is about the highest I can give it, but definitely a WrestleMania that needed the, the fat needed to be trimmed. Mm hmm. Like Lesnar um, and Goldberg going as long you know, as it did. Yeah, another good example would be is in a couple of years, WrestleMania 22 has 13 matches, and oh, there are a couple matches you could have easily axed from that card. Man, that's going to be a marathon too, isn't it? But uh, yeah. hey, folks, thank you all so much for tuning in. Hit that subscribe button and that notification bell as well. Big freaking weekend in wrestling. We got Clash at the Castle and All Out. Um, both companies better bring their A game. We still don't know what the main event of All Out is, oddly enough. Nope. Um, we're going to find out uh, tomorrow night. Yeah. And let me just say, if Drew McIntyre does not win the Undisputed Universal Championship, I will be very disappointed in Triple H. But And um, NXT versus NXT UK Worlds Collide. If you are into that, I am going to be watching all of the shows this weekend. It's every single great. one. Every single yeah. one. Yeah. We're getting spoiled. We're getting spoiled. If it's If you think it's too much wrestling, then you're probably not a wrestling fan. Um, but we also, our next retro pay-per-view is going to be Backlash 2004, which should be a, uh, fun little discussion there. Which, believe it or not, if you love this Triple H, Triple H, this Triple Threat match as much as we did, they're going to run it back. I've never seen that before. That has to be one of the only times this has ever happened, a Triple Threat match with a rematch Triple Threat. It is a Triple H match, all things considered, so there you go. (laughs) You're not wrong. Um, but yeah, folks stay tuned for the next one. Talk to you later.